call to order this uh, June 19th, 2023 meeting. Recording in progress. I'll repeat that, June 19th, 2023 meeting of the Waterbury Select Board. First item on our agenda is to approve the agenda. Do I have a motion? So moved. Second. Thank you, the motion has been moved and seconded. Any discussion? Is that a hand? I lost, I seem to have lost sound from you all. Oh, oh there we go. Can hear us. Uh, so the motion has been moved and seconded to approve the agenda, Danny. Any further discussion? <laughs> no. Hearing none, all in favor say aye. 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 Any opposed? Any abstentions? We have approved the agenda. Next item is the consent agenda. Do I have a motion? So moved. Second. All right, moved and seconded. Any further discussion on the consent agenda? Hearing none, all in favor say aye. 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 Any opposed? Any abstentions? All right. Roger. Yes, sir. Just if there are any, any NQID questions, we're here to answer them. But if it's a formality, that's fine. Okay. Well, I appreciate you coming. But uh, from what I can tell, the, the motion has passed. Okay. Thank you. All right. Congratulations, and we wish you the best of luck for a successful uh, NQID 2023. Uh, now we're at the public uh, portion where we welcome any comments that are not on the warned agenda. Uh, I'd like to just start by recognizing that uh, this is the 19th of June, federal holiday for Juneteenth, uh, also known as Emancipation Day, Freedom Day, and Jubilee Day. And uh, we are celebrating by conducting the business of uh, the town and uh, also recognizing uh, the historic uh, precedence uh, of, of this uh, historic day. Uh, secondly, I'd like to recognize the uh, volunteer work of the um, Downstreet volunteers. We had over 20 volunteers from Downstreet come and help us earlier this month uh, with uh, a bunch of recreation projects. Uh, they did a great job and we really appreciate their support. And finally, I'd like to recognize the contributions to Waterbury by Steve Lotspeech. Steve, uh, you have uh, served ably as our planning director and uh, a leader on the tree committee and our representative on Central Vermont Regional Planning Committee and most recently as chair of the executive committee of the uh, Central Vermont Regional Planning Committee. So uh, we would just like to recognize all your contributions to the town of Waterbury and uh, hope that you're enjoying your semi-retirement and uh, look forward to any guidance that you might be able to provide on the following uh, items on the agenda. Okay. Thanks, Roger. I really appreciate that. It means a lot. Well, thank you for all your service. Um, any other uh, comments during this public session? I'm not seeing anything. <laughs> all right. We'll move forward. Tree committee appointments. Uh, we have two candidates for two positions. Uh, uh, Erica Fuller uh, has uh, resigned and her the remainder of her tenure uh, expires in 2025, so that'll be a two-year appointment. And then Steve Lotspeech's uh, tenure uh, expires in 2024, so that'll be a one-year appointment. And we have two candidates, Anita Holstrom and Zinn Wolf. Either of those candidates in presence? Anita. Yeah, can you tell us why uh, you'd like to uh, be on the tree committee and whether you have a preference for the, either the one year or the two year uh, tenure? Sure. So um, I've lived in Waterbury for 23 years and um, I've been a member of the garden club for at least 20 of that. Um, 
have known Jane Brown for all of that time. And uh, my background is in my education is in plant science and business and landscape design. Um, I've been working at Cushman Design Group as the business manager. It's an architecture firm in Stowe for 25 years. And um, just have been really working on my own property, um, enjoy gardening, enjoy taking care of trees. I've planted a bird habitat here over the last 20 years. Um, last year, I completed the certification for the Vermont Master Naturalist Program to get a little bit more environmental training and also the environmental leadership training through um, the Agency of Natural Resources. And just looking for a way to use um, some of my knowledge and really get more involved in the Waterbury community, just beautifying it and creating habitat and everything that trees will do for us. Sounds excellent. Uh, do you have a preference as to whether you'd like to serve for two year in the two year slot or the one year slot? Well, I, I'd like to do two, but if one is the opening that works best, then I would do that um, as a start. I've, yeah. Yeah. Okay. Great. Any further questions from the board? No. Do I have a motion? I can't. I'm not hearing anymore. Oh boy. Oh, again. Oh, now I got you. Okay. <laughs> it's, it's my microphone that does the trick. No, she no? can't hear from the owl. So oh. oh. Yeah. Okay. But you can hear us now? I can now, yes. Okay. I think Excellent. it was our Compline. Wow, words contemplating our pause. Oh, yes, no pausing. <laughs> it was just the no pause. No pausing, folks. Um, I understand Zinn is not going to be able to join us tonight. Is that correct? But he has. Uh, He's expressed an interest. I think I included his emails. Yes. He did, he did express an interest by email, and he's been before us previously as well. Uh, so he's also interested, uh, we know, and uh, has a uh, budding uh, tree business as well, landscaping business. Um, so I'm open for any motions from the board. I would move to... Um... Uh, select Nita for the two-year term and Zinn for the one-year term on the tree committee. All right. I'll second that. All right. The motion has been moved and seconded. Any further discussion? Just say thank you both for your interest in serving on the committee. Yes, thank you both. Yep. Uh, we're, we're, we have a, a wonderful uh, amount of uh, public engagement, I'd say, uh, at the town level here in Waterbury. Steve, do you have any comments on the, the, these nominations? No, I think it's great. Uh, Nita has um, attended at least one meeting and uh, has a lot of expertise, which is great. And um, Zinn has good tree service. He worked for Vermont Arborist for a while. He's a neighbor of ours, mm -hmm. grew up in our uh, neighborhood and uh, has a lot of energy. So no, I think it's great. It's uh, super that we've got seven people with such enthusiasm that makes me feel really good great pass the torch any further discussion hearing none all in favor say aye aye, aye. 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 any opposed any abstentions congratulations nita and to zim for your two and one year positions on the tree committee we look forward to your service and thanks for showing up again tonight Okay. Uh, the tree ordinance. No, I skipped one. Oh yeah. Ha ha. Good point. The CVR PC and Transportation Committee. Um, so again, we have three positions. Uh, Steve is retiring from his. Uh, position as uh, Waterbury's commissioner uh, on the uh, Central Vermont Regional Planning Committee, uh, Commission. And then there's an alternate position. Uh, so we have commissioner and an alternate. And then we have a position opening up on the Transportation Committee. Uh, and uh, we've got some background on that. Uh, Steve, do you feel like you want to give us any further clarification about the responsibilities of those uh, different positions? Sure, I'd be glad to. Um, I've served 
<coughs> excuse me, the longest on the Transportation Advisory Committee, which has a representative appointed by each town. It's a, a separate body. Oh, I'm sorry. Yes. Um, sorry. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Steve Lotz. Come forward. forward. Steve Lotz. Come forward. Yes. Okay. Thanks for. Um, yeah, for letting me speak about this. So the Central Mont Regional Planning Commission uh, is made up of all the Washington County towns and three towns in Orange County. And um, so the two positions on the commission are the commissioner and the alternate. Um, the alternate can attend any meetings, but can only uh, be a voting member in the absence of the commissioner. Mm -hmm. And that's optional to have an alternate. It's helpful, but it's optional. Uh, the Transportation Advisory Committee uh, is a, a separate group. They meet on fourth Tuesday evenings instead of second Tuesday evenings. Uh, they're an advisory group that um, covers a lot of ground in terms of uh, assistance to municipalities, to the, um, the various federal programs, and does uh, project development in the region. So. Um, so the three positions are important, and um, it's probably most essential that we would fill the commissioner position and um, the transportation advisory committee appointee. They're all one-year positions, so uh, they, they come up for uh, renewal or, or a new applicant each year. Okay. And they expire on July 1st. Right, that's why I'm outgoing now. And I've been the board chair for it's my second year. And then I've been I was chair of the transportation advisory committee for uh, a long time, and uh, it's it's a really good group as well. Okay. Great. Well, yeah, and I think we have one of the candidates here. Mm -hmm. Doug is here. Doug Reeson. Okay. Yeah. Um, Doug, would you like to come up? Sure. Uh, Doug, you've uh, addressed this previously as a candidate for the Planning Commission. Um, could you explain why you're interested in this position and your preference uh, for, for one of the three different uh, opportunities? Well, thank you. Um, I'm interested in the role on the Regional Planning Commission because I think that suits my background and interests. The municipal uh, code reviews, the brownfields work, the forestry work, those are all things I'm interested in and I have some experience in. Mm -hmm. The Transportation Committee, um, I hadn't been aware before tonight that there was an opening on that mm -hmm. and that, that I could be considered for that. Um, I spent 10 years um, on a citizens advisory group for a very controversial bridge replacement project in Seattle and was in the thick of it um, for, I think it was a $150 million project by the time it was done. And there were issues with, um, economic justice, going through a poor neighborhood and navigational rights and things like that. And my construction background is well suited to the transportation side of it. So I'd be interested in either position. Okay. All right. Great. Any other questions for Doug? Oh, I really didn't stand. No? Okay, Doug, thank you. Uh, I'm gonna just Discuss uh, two other candidates, and then we'll uh, we'll see where the where things fall. Um, another uh, candidate is uh, Monica Callan, and I believe Monica is not able to join us tonight, uh, but she has expressed an interest uh, in. Uh, was it both positions or all three positions, or well, did, was I, it clear? Yeah, I got the information uh, from Steve that gave the details, which I did send out, but Mr. Gleason's pointed out that he, he didn't know. I didn't highlight it in my email either, I admit. Wow. Um, so I don't know what Monica's preference would be. Obviously, all three of them were aware of the, of the CBRP representative position. Right, um, right. And not as aware of the transportation. Okay. Um, so that's a great question. I don't know what Monica would wish to be appointed. Well, to. and uh, 
Steve is resigning as of this month, so we actually need a representative for next month. So we, it's important that we. Public commission. Yeah, uh, Doug. Sorry. In fairness, when I read the correspondence, I was looking at the Regional Planning Commission, mm -hmm. and there very well could have been a reference to a position that I hadn't been contemplating or been aware of. So the notice could very well have been there. Yeah. Oh, fair enough. Yeah, I didn't highlight it. Yeah. So. Mm -hmm. Try to be as comprehensive as possible. The other candidate here uh, that has expressed interest is Robert Adler. And Robert, I don't know if you're with us tonight or we have any further information about uh, his uh, interest. But uh, hearing none, um, I will uh, take a motion from the board if uh, the board feels uh, that there, any member feels. So moved. And given what Steve told us, I suppose we could have the same uh, individual for both positions as well. Hmm. You, you could. There are some commissioners, um, I was going to mention that, there are some commissioners who serve on the Transportation Advisory Committee. There's some, um, there may be an alternate commissioner that serves on, also serves on the Transportation Advisory Committee. So there's no prohibition in the bylaws that says that a, an individual can't do both. Of course, the alternate and the commissioner have to be two individuals. Mm -hmm. Do you see how I well, that, Doug? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Give the opportunity to say yes. Yeah. Uh, uh, King. <laughs> Doug, would you be interested in doing both? No, thank you. <laughs> <laughs> I'm trying to put my foot in here and get some experience in mm -hmm. areas I haven't worked before. And Perfect. I think is a good table ball. Fair enough. Yeah, you yeah. could wait. Well, I don't know. Yeah. You yeah. could yeah. wait on the translation advisor. You right. could wait on both. The alternate and the Transportation Advisory Committee, if you'd rather reach out to those individuals and see what their interest level is, it is a time commitment. Right. And I, you may not want to make an assumption about what they would like to be involved with. Thank so you. that's an alternative, is just to appoint the commissioner and then reach out to them and then maybe at your next meeting um, try to fill yeah. those other two positions. That's mm -hmm. just an idea. That, that may be sage advice. Um, do I have a motion? Hearing that, then I'll move to appoint Doug Greeson as Waterbury's new CVRPC um, representative, effective July 1, 2023. Um, and then just note for all of us here in the room that we would plan to follow up at the next meeting with Robert and Monica about interest in alternate or transportation advisory committee. Okay. Seconded. The motion has been moved and seconded. Uh, any further discussion? Hearing none, all in favor say aye. 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 Any opposed? Any abstentions? Doug, congratulations. We look forward to your service. And thank you for stepping forward. <laughs> and uh, we do have a special uh, meeting oh, that yeah. will be warned for uh, the 28th. Mm -hmm. right. I already, but I yeah, oh, well, okay. Oh, we've, it's already warned? The, well, cool. well, outside the window, we can... Okay, outside the window, we could uh, potentially get input uh, on the two remaining positions uh, for that meeting. Mm -hmm. All right. We can move forward to the tree care ordinance. Um, I know that this has been uh, proposed by the uh, tree committee and... Uh, with uh, had some input from uh, our municipal manager. Uh, so would you like to inform us about the origins of this ordinance? So Stuart Whitney is here. Stuart put a lot of work into this draft. And, mm -hmm. and also Michael Bard's neighbor, which is <laughs> kind of frowning, uh, sitting so in his move, seat. We're going to move this right here. <laughs> okay. It's okay. The okay. Neighbor us. <laughs> All right. Stuart and uh, Steve, go ahead and just give us a, a little background on, on this ordinance and well, while you're supporting um, it. Steve might help with the original background because he's been on the tree committee much longer than I have. Um, but about a year, almost two years ago, we um, sort of got wind on the committee that um, other um, tree committees or tree boards in the state of Vermont were developing tree policies or tree care ordinances for their towns to set guidelines um, on the maintenance and protection of 
of shade trees. Um, so at, about a year and a half ago, I contacted the Vermont Urban and Community Forestry Program. I spoke with them about this. They sent me some examples of other towns that have done this and, um, and sort of got us going. Um, so between the Vermont Urban and Community Forestry Program, the Vermont Tree Warden statutes, and some examples that we were provided, um, a, I developed this tree care ordinance for Waterbury. Um, it is, it's very bulletproof kind of language. It's very similar to every other tree care ordinance in the state or, or tree care policies. And, and that was how it was designed. It, it wasn't designed to be artistic and creative and <laughs> loosey-goosey to some degree. Um, it, it, they wanted some consistency and they wanted some sort of rigor and, and they wanted to make sure that it was in conjunction um, with the 2021 Vermont Tree Warden statutes. Mm -hmm. So, so the so the organization of this is very similar to to every other um, town that we have um, that has one. Um, the the common goal was just to unify the language um, between you know towns and, and cities in Vermont, um, and and the mission is to plant, protect, maintain, and and remove shade trees within municipal areas. Mm -hmm. um, in Along the way, we discovered that most of the tree committees or tree peoples in other cities are called tree boards. Mm -hmm. um, so in, in conjunction with this tree care ordinance, we incorporated the change of our committee to tree board versus tree committee to be in alignment with um, what the Vermont Urban and Community Forestry Program was suggesting that we do. And they were pretty much the sort of the tree gurus that, that led this. Um, and so what you have today is, is a, um, a document that's been through many um, revisions, many eyes have set upon it. Um, and I think um, it's not necessarily perfect, but it's ready to go. And it's been approved um, by the Vermont Urban and Community Forestry Program, Elise Shradner and Joanne Garten, who worked with us um, have, have approved it and, and, and said that it is in line with other towns and cities in Vermont. Roger, could I just add something? Please do. I think um, one important aspect of this is that uh, the tree committee or board um, doesn't have a lot of statutory authority. They are really an advisory group. They're advisory to the town. They can develop plans. Um, uh, the, you know, work with you, the select board, to apply for grants and oversee projects. The tree warden and deputy tree warden, if a town has one, are really the ones who have the authority under statute to uh, do things like evaluate a, a tree that's in the right of way. Um, if there's some debate whether it's a hazard tree or not, or maybe a neighbor wants a tree taken down, then it's really the tree warden who has the authority under statute. In some situations, uh, there needs to be a public hearing. If it's a, um, the statute's pretty um, prescriptive in, in some aspects, and that's, that's covered here in the ordinance. And one of the things that, uh, this is more of a sort of a housekeeping to do, is that it uh, would be really good if we got either uh, Celia or um, Bill Woodruff as the deputy tree warden. So it doesn't have to happen right now, but I think it would be a good, a good idea because sometimes there needs to be kind of an on the spot um, determination about a hazard tree, whether it should come down or not. There, uh, Mike Lociavo has been appointed as, I think you, mm -hmm. you're aware, as the tree warden. I think he's up there in the corner. Oh, okay, great. Hey, Mike. <laughs> yeah, I won't speak hey. for you. So you're the tree warden. I didn't realize you were on the call. So, uh, but that's, that's mainly what I wanted to add. This doesn't, um, it, it does not dictate what happens to a tree on private property. It, it's uh, public property, uh, municipal properties and rights of ways is what this <clears throat> covers for the town road rights of ways. Uh, a shade tree is six inches or larger. 
So it's not dictating what happens to necessarily small trees, though in a park, if it's a, um, a flowering tree, something of that nature, then it would uh, fall under this, uh, this ordinance. So that's, that's what I wanted to add. Right. And I, I think it, it governs, it sort of describes what we do as a committee, but it also gives the town some sort of meat to, you know, enforce some of the, you know, statutes if they're violated. Um, mm -hmm. I don't right. know that we've had much experience with that, but when talking to Elise and Joanne, um, you know, there's people moving in from out of state and the climate's changing. And, and so this sort of protects the trees that are planted in the municipal way from being taken down from a private own owner who, who happens to own the house or the land that that right of way abuts. Right. So. Okay. Any other questions from the board? Yeah, Alyssa. I have a couple questions. I guess I don't know who should speak to this, but I'm curious just about technicalities around if we, it sounds like, would need to change the tree committee into a board. I guess I should first say thank you to all those on the tree committee for working on this, and Steve. Um, appreciate it. And I will say, I have friends who said, what ordinances are you reviewing? And I was like, tree care. They're like, you have an ordinance for that? I said, well, we're going to talk about it. Um, so a kind of nuts and bolts question about mechanics for us as a select board around, is this an ordinance we would need to warn for the 60 days and receive public comment on? This is just a preliminary conversation, or is it a different type of what would next potential next steps look like for this? It's an ordinance, so you need to warn it for the 60 days if you choose to adopt it tonight. OK. Yeah. And is that the goal for the trade committee or the ask for us is to have us warn this draft for that public is, care? That's what we're asking. Yes. Mm -hmm. yes. yes. Yeah. Got it. Thank you. Kane. Okay. Um, to piggyback on Alyssa's question, do we need to to like make a like do something formal to change it from a tree committee to a tree board to change the word? Well, my understanding is that if you adopt this ordinance, it's automatic with the ordinance that the name's changed. And that's all it really is, is an, is a yeah. name change. Yeah. Right. Uh, okay. Yeah. Back to Alyssa. I guess I have some questions for Steve about how we see this potentially interacting with other municipal permitting and processes. I'm laughing okay. because I know you're not staffing it anymore, but at the last <laughs> planning commission meeting, I will say, like, cards on the table. So I live on Main Street in downtown, where, candidly, public right-of-way is often the vast percentage of folks' yards. So mm -hmm. as I'm reading and understanding, unless I'm incorrect, this covers, like, the two nice trees right along Main Street um, in my landlord's ramp, which totally understand the purpose and why it's there. Um, my question is about we have, you know, no person shall plant any tree within public ways and places without permission from the tree warden and deputy tree warden. So if I'm a property owner on Main Street, and that is, I apologize, page three under protection, um, how do I know that? I guess I just want to say, like, I know the planning commission is thinking about how to make permitting user friendly. They were actually just having a discussion about. Um, the most effective way to do site plan requirements to encourage both trees but also plantings and ornamentals. So I'm just, again, big picture thinking about how does this particular tree-specific ordinance plug into other pieces we have that regulate what folks put in their front yard. And I guess that's my, my caution is just regardless of, of this ordinance on itself, I want to make sure it's information we are appropriately sharing with property owners in ways we already interact with them. I'll, I'll speak to that. Please do. <laughs> <laughs> sure. So town, town politics and governance is Yeah, well, <laughs> I think issues around rights of ways are an educational issue. Yeah. And staff, Tom and Bill Woodruff and Celia and others deal with this all the time and Neil. So it's really an educational issue with the Main Street project. Of course, there was a huge right away process there that hopefully with all those owners clarified what was right in the right of way and what wasn't. But um, as far as a, a landscape uh, section in the zoning, um, that if there is part of a landscape plan that involves a planting in the right of way, then that's going to have to come um, in according to this to the tree warden mm -hmm. and and maybe be probably be brought to the the manager or public works director so i think um landscape plans as you recall from i think being on the planning commission primarily deal with private property 
Occasionally there are asks to do plantings in along a street or something, which is fine. But um, that normally there has to be a coordination process for that through the zoning. But this wouldn't apply to a landscape plan that's strictly on private property. It wouldn't really have any bearing to that. Totally. Yeah. No, I agree, and I really appreciate that clarification, particularly that it's not most people. I guess I would just say, in the spirit of we have like nine ordinances we're reviewing <laughs> later, trying to think about that coordination, um, I just would, if we choose to move forward, ask that maybe we ask Neil about, I mean, again, it probably is just a staff outreach thing of flagging. I just need <laughs> to think about someone who is moving forward and, and doesn't, you know, is it just adding a checkbox or something like that? just to make sure folks know that this is covered. Yeah, well, I think we should have the, have Neil and the Planning Commission take a look at this and, and you know, Neil can educate them about the ordinance. That's always a, a good idea. And, um, you know, I, I would have a, a bit of a comment period. I don't know that it, I don't think the tree committee wants it to drag out, but I, I think this is not a final draft. It, uh, it's here for your information and comment. So, you know, uh, Stuart has a couple editorial corrections that um, he's recommending, and there may be other changes that uh, Tom has reviewed it. And we've incorporated his comments, but um, you know, of course, the board should have your uh, input as well. Tom, would we need to have a corrected final version in order to <coughs> warn it, or can uh, adjustments be made? Uh, you can make adjustments to this tonight. Um, it's a warned item, so you can amend the ordinance mm -hmm. just so long as we're entirely clear about what the amendments are. And then we could warn that final version. So well, you could there, adopt there's this There's one sort of important word that's missing in one of, in one of under, under protection. If you look at the second paragraph where it starts with penalties for such actions may apply, and then the second sentence says, whoever shall willfully mar, da 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 da, without permission from, the municipality may be fined. So there should be a word may be inserted there before be fined at the end of that sentence to, to complete who, who really will be fined. It's not the municipality that will be fined, it's, it's whoever mars the tree. But other than that, I, re I reread it in preparation for this meeting and, um, and I think as far as the tree committee slash board is concerned, it's, it's ready to go to the next level of um, eyes and critique and um, revisions or suggestions or whatever um, people are uncomfortable with or unsure of. Yep. I, I, I've done, I, I, this was, I, I worked in the healthcare system for many, many years and, and I've dealt with policies and procedures and, and curriculum and blah, blah, blah. And we always treated those as living documents something that could go back at any time and be corrected or altered or, um, or fixed if, if we discover something is wrong. So, so what we're presenting you today, as Steve suggested, isn't necessarily a final, perfect um, ordinance, but it's where we're at at this point and, and we're ready to go forward. And we've had enough support of it as it is that it could stand alone without anybody's corrections, but um, it will only be stronger with more input. So everyone at home is having audio issues. Okay, you can't hear us. If anything I can do about it. Whatever you just did, like getting up, it got automatically better. So, so just I stand, just stand, stand up. Here. Stand up. <laughs> a lot better now on my end. Um, I wow. honestly was like, like what, I don't know if there's a cord that gets twisted or a mic that's being Ghost. muffled or something, but. Um, audio guy who has more technology <laughs> experience I than me. I don't know that no. at all. No, I, my question actually is whether all these other microphones. We're losing it again. Okay. Is it just the internet connectivity? That was my other question. I don't know. Sorry, I see. Don't, you want to try changing the, changing the Wi-Fi? The video is good, so it's not going to with. Yeah, I can change mm -hmm. the Wi-Fi. No, it's not. He's what he's saying. That's correct. Uh, okay. can, how much did you miss? Internet access, <laughs> TLW. Yeah, so I'm on, I'm, I'm on a protected network. So yeah, I think that's fine. If I go on a public network, I can't imagine that's going to work. Looks like we have two chambers. Mm -hmm. But if everybody could speak up, all right. keep wiggling the cords, but that's about all I got for you. I'm sorry. 
Okay. So for the group, I'll just reiterate what our, our request is, is we're requesting that this document be reviewed, sent out to the, um, to the public for um, comments, and then to come back with um, whatever suggestions they have, and then um, to have it approved. Mm -hmm. And Tom, you've reviewed this uh, from a municipal standpoint. Uh, I reviewed it. The Woodruff has reviewed it. We're pretty comfortable with it. Okay. If there's no further discussion, do I have a motion from the board? Now I need to be my part, I guess. <laughs> <laughs> oh, there we <they're> go. <laughs> Ike, am I warning for public hearing or for public comment? You're, you're warning to adopt the ordinance, and then the adoption would occur automatically after. <laughs> then there's a staff process to do the appropriate publications. The adoption would occur automatically in 60 days, unless there's some form of public comment that causes you to. So it's not like zoning where there's changes and substantive changes. It's just, I'm warning this draft in front of me. I think this draft in front of you with the addition of the word may under the protection section. So she's, I'm sorry, I, now I'm thinking, she's making a motion to warn this? Well, to, to adopt the Well, that's my, that's my adopt. question, I guess. I personally would love to have a little <coughs> public comment before I'm warning it to adopt, just personally. Um, not that I'm opposed to doing so, but. Yeah, you don't have to adopt it tonight. We were anticipating this would be a two-step process, that this yeah. was an initial review, uh, answer questions, see if you have any comments, and then uh, at a subsequent meeting, um, put it on the agenda to adopt and right. incorporate any comments at that point into a final draft and make that available to the public and, and so on for that meeting. So that's what I would suggest. And it gives you some time to really go through this with a fine tooth comb and I let, um, you know, maybe let Stuart and so me know if you have a motion could be to add this to the agenda for July 17th. Great. Mm -hmm. okay. mm -hmm. So on behalf of the select board, I move to thank the tree committee for their work in preparing and staff the town of Waterbury tree care ordinance and um, move that we add this as an agenda item for adoption of the ordinance at our July 17th, did you say? Yes. Um, select board meeting and advise the public and relevant uh, boards and committees that if they have any comments, who should they go to? Well, they can go to me. They should go to Tom Lights prior to then. And I'll share them with the tree committee, mm -hmm. since Steve is on his way to <laughs> <I'm not done. laughs> Victory lap, knock on wood. That's okay, um, but I'm available. If you I'll, like, I'll give you my email. You can share them with me, and I'll incorporate them in the, in the draft yeah. and, and send it back to you. OK. Right. That all right, Karen, yeah. in terms of those oh, little yeah. rambling? Oh, yeah. Um, I'm sorry, I think the only part I missed was who gets the comments. Is it Stuart or Tom? Tom, and he just noted he will forward them to the tree committee oh, okay. and others. Oh, okay. Because I should be all set. Thank you. All right, we have a motion. Do I hear a second? Second. All right, it's been moved and seconded. Any further discussion? Hearing none. Oh, just one yes, item to note. Um, they made a great point about a deputy tree warden. Mm -hmm. We should probably put that in the parking lot just so we don't. Yeah, don't lose Forget it. That. At this yeah, yeah right. add that to an agenda soon. We'll see whether Celia or Bill Woodruff wants, would yeah, like that. I, that's really something you can handle. I I've got a couple other figures of candidates out. too. So. Oh, okay. Well, fine. Go for it. All right. <laughs> yep. And um, also, we might want to clarify this uh, the transformation of the tree committee into the tree board. Uh, and make sure the terms match. That is like one example of a minor correction I had. This gives language around terms. Is that what we're appointing to currently, et cetera, et cetera. Mm -hmm. All right. I think all of that is included in the spirit of the motion. Any further discussion? Hearing none, all in favor say aye. 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 Any opposed? Any abstentions? We're going to abstain from this one, Roger, because I missed 
most of that conversation. <laughs> um, and then just to clarify on, on our end, um, I'm going to review the document and then any feedback or questions talk to Tom about and then be ready to vote at the next meeting, at the July meeting. Okay, thank you. All right, well, we hey, still- Hey, Leah Roger, I, I plan on abstaining as well because uh, audio was not good for the majority of that presentation. Thanks. Okay, for the record, we have three votes for two abstentions. The motion still passes uh, with a quorum of three. And um, we will address this on July 17th. Thank you very much. Okay, thank you. Appreciate your time. Appreciate it. Do you, do you need my email? Uh, yeah. All right. Next up, just checking the time. We're still ahead of schedule. Um, the uh, planning director and acting zoning administrator appointment. Yes. We received uh, notice. Uh, perhaps uh, Tom can explain uh, how this came to pass. So the, the planning commission at their last meeting in executive session recommend, recommended a candidate. Uh, I had sent you a memo about um, some of the conversations I've had with that person and some revisions to the job description. Um, and the way the job description is written, the we previously have a had a director of planning and zoning, and then an assistant zoning administrator. Uh, the key part of that is that the director of planning and zoning could had had the legal authority of the zoning administrator to sign permits. Mm -hmm. So that is retained. Uh, the big difference in the job description is that the planning director would not have oversight duties over a zoning administrator. Uh, that zoning administrator would report directly to me, which is fine. I'm comfortable with that. Um, if you want to discuss any particulars about the candidate, uh, that is a worthy item for executive session. Or if you're comfortable appointing the candidate, uh, that would have to be done in public session. So in essence, if you have the action I'm asking for tonight is to appoint the candidate who would be the planning director and the acting zoning administrator. Mm -hmm. You would then go and seek to hire a zoning administrator. Mm -hmm. So the planning director would only then be the acting in the event that the zoning administrator is absent. Right. Okay. Okay. Any other questions for Tom? <coughs> they don't look... Oh, yeah, Alyssa. I'm just clarifying the the um, uh, appointing the acting zoning administrator would be until that position is hired for. Correct. But there isn't like a deputy type model where they have that authority in even a hired zoning administrator's absence to sign permits or no? They would in the absence of the zoning administrator. So absence is not defined as filled or unfilled, it could be vacation. Okay, it could be partial. That was just my question for something mm -hmm. short-term like that. Thank you. Mm -hmm. yeah. I, I personally feel comfortable with the, the proposal, but uh, open to other suggestions from the board. I like those changes. Go ahead. I said I, I like those changes. I think that makes more sense than our previous uh, job description. So, how are we moving this one? We are moving <coughs> to... You'd, you'd have to use the name. Um, so, your motion would be to appoint uh, Neil Leitner as the planning director and acting zoning administrator. So moved. <laughs> nice one. Did we catch that? No. Um, I move to appoint Neil Leitner as Waterbury's planning director and acting zoning administrator concurrent with the planning commission's recommendation. Do I hear a second? Second. All right. It's been moved and seconded. Any further discussion? I've been very pleased with all of my interactions with uh, Mr. Leitner and uh, feel he's very well qualified. I'm thankful that he has decided to move forward and take the position. Um, 
and uh, also uh, congratulate our municipal manager for making these arrangements. Uh, I think we're in good shape, and he appears to have the full support of the Planning Commission as well. So uh, I think uh, this is a great move. Any further discussion? Hearing none, all in favor say aye. 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 Any opposed? Any abstentions? All right, congratulations to Neil Lightner. And now the, the follow-up will be when we have a zoning administrator candidate. Um, oddly enough, even though that person works closely with the DRB, uh, that person has to be recommended by the Planning Commission mm -hmm. again. So we'll go through the same process uh, with a different person. All right. Have you opened up the, I guess you wouldn't open up anything up until this gets passed, right? So we'll have that. We'll have that job posted within a couple of days. All right. And Very. we can include it in the charter as a position to streamline the appointment <laughs> process for in a hypothetical next step for that. <laughs> All right. Moving forward. Ordinance and policy review, vendor ordinance, entertainment ordinance, recreational facilities ordinance, fields and facilities reservation policies, recreation department parks, uh, parks facilities policy. So yes. these are a number of different ordinances that our town manager will now explain. I wanted to try to muddle through these. Um, I noticed that Robbie has joined. I think that may be Robert Adler. Oh. Um, I just wanted to bring that to attention. Mm. We could um, go back to that. I sure. Suppose, huh? Sorry to interrupt. No, go ahead. Robbie, is that you? Yes. Yeah, sorry, everyone. I'm. Uh, I was just following the agenda time, and it was a little unclear to me when to join. I have two young kids, so I was just trying to. Problem. Yeah. Uh, so sorry if I missed this, the part of the agenda that I was supposed to join for. Not a problem. Yeah, uh, our practice just uh, for your information is that if we, there's nothing holding us back, we will move through the agenda with uh, as much alacrity as possible. Um, so uh, previous to your joining, uh, we uh, interviewed uh, Doug Greeson who expressed an interest in the uh, uh, regional uh, commission as regional commission representative uh, on the Central Vermont Regional Planning Committee, and the board moved to appoint him to that position. There are two remaining positions, which are the alternate to that uh, to our representative representative on the um, commission and uh, the transportation committee representative from Waterbury. They're both one year appointments. Uh, they meet on separate nights. Um, as uh, an alternate, uh, you'd be welcome to attend all of the uh, uh, CVRPC meetings, but would only have voting uh, authority when Doug was not uh, available. So, um, would you have an interest in either of those two positions? Uh, I think I will respectfully ba bow out uh, of either. Um, so, yeah. Um, Thank you, and say again, sorry I mi missed the uh, the part of the agenda, but. Yeah, uh, we also regret that, uh, but um, you know, we welcome you to uh, look at other opportunities to. Uh, I, I will keep, I will continue to, to monitor, um, yeah, appointments associated with zoning and planning. Thank you. Okay, Rob, thank you for, for joining in, and I apologize that uh, things didn't quite work out as, as we had hoped, but uh, there you are. No, I'll um, my fault. Um, have a good night. Okay, thank you. All right, let's move back to uh, the uh, ordinances. Tom, you were saying. Okay, uh, the reason I put uh, so many on the agenda um, was to, to some extent, go through them and to some extent illustrate uh, part of the challenge we've had. Um, some of this arose because 
uh, we've had conversations with people who come to the town and, and they don't know what permit they need. Yep. Um, and in fact, if you go to the town website and try to figure it out, it's quite the struggle. Um, it was quite the struggle even for us being new here. And so the first thing that we'll do uh, that we don't need permission to do, we'll just do is we're going to redesign our website to some extent and make a checklist and make it a little bit of one stop shopping. Mm -hmm. Some is on the town website, some is on the Waterbury Rec website. Not entirely clear if you're someone coming to the town what you need to do necessarily. Uh, it's probably clear if you've done it before, but if you're a new vendor. <coughs> um, so that's part of the challenge. Um, I want to quickly go through a few of these to give you some of the themes. Um, I'd like to start with the entertainment ordinance, which is the oldest in the bunch. <coughs> and I met with Danny about the entertainment ordinance. Um, and the real challenge here, after delving into it uh, far, is that <coughs> section one, the definition of show, which really talks about live entertainment, concerts, plays, uh, magicians, things like that. Uh, that definition is embedded uh, and comes from state law. And that old expression, Vermont being a Dillon's rule state, which means you can't do uh, anything locally that the state does not permit you to do. Uh, we had talked about in modifying this ordinance to include parades, which mm -hmm. was something that was talked about for a while, mm -hmm. but in fact, it's not entirely clear we can because parade is not a show as defined by the state. Mm. What we could do um, on pages two and three are approval conditions. Um, and the approval conditions for shows are really comprehensive um, and pretty good, requiring crowd, crowd control, medical personnel. We talked about that with mm -hmm. Circus Marcus, things like that. So we, we could add an approval condition that effectively says, follows the town's parade policy. Mm. And subsequently we have a parade policy. And that, I believe, would be entirely consistent with state law. So we could address the issue of parades uh, there. Uh, but functionally, this ordinance, even though it's dated, is consistent with the law. Um, <coughs> and I actually, despite the fact that I initially reviewed it and, must, and thought to myself, well, this is an ordinance from the uh, late 90s, uh, we'll probably want to rebuild it fresh. I, after reviewing it, I concluded I really don't see a need to rebuild this fresh. Mm. There could certainly be some minor tweaks, and, and that one... Uh, is one of them, um, you know, but in general, it's consistent with the law. The law hasn't changed. So that being said, since I mentioned parade policy, I did sit down and I did it late, but I finally have a draft parade policy. Okay. Oh. So you. I'm going to pass that around. And it's it's Why are you, Danny. Danny. Something I noticed. Tom, is that in Montpelier's special event policy, they call it a special event, um, not necessarily a show, and it they define it on their own. And I don't know if that's different, be, like a special event versus entertainment versus show, or, um, but they just defined it as a race, parade, festival, street initiative, or event that uses public property. So versus like, so I don't know, it's just something to, to consider or just keep in the research, but yeah, I didn't look at Montpelier's. I did look at a number of, uh, not a number, several towns that have uh, their rules about parades embedded into law. Um, and South Burlington is probably the best example, but South Burlington actually has that embedded in their charter. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So they've got specific legislative authority to regulate parades, um, and it's quite clear. Um, they don't have to necessarily refer to a somewhat unclear section of state law. Um, but the parade policy um, I worked on with uh, Gary Dillon, and we thought um, to put out in front of you a, a pretty minimal policy that I think hits the highlights, but every parade is different, um, 
and from my conversations with Gary, that the challenge uh, this past year was uh, the Festival of Lights. Right. Um, and it might be a, a good idea to have a policy in advance just because we'll have a new town staff. Um, so the rec director was pretty involved in that in prior years. <coughs> With the turnover we have, uh, might not be a bad idea to get in front of it from that mm -hmm. perspective. Mm -hmm. But in essence, um, Gary's suggestion was the policy doesn't need to be incredibly detailed because uh, they ultimately have to answer these questions. This will be in front of the select board as part of their as part of their permit process for a special event. Um, and each parade is different. The Little, the Little League parade this year was how many kids, Karen? Uh, Hundred kids, not a ton of spectators. Um, as you can imagine, mostly parents of the of the families. Um, and then we have two really large parades. Um, and and I think in general the folks do a pretty good job planning. But Gary just wants some ability to essentially say uh, we need to put these things down on paper. We need to make sure that we've got some uh, some ability to regulate it, some ability to do corrective action in the future. Mm -hmm. Did you try defining a parade? No, because um, the challenge there is I think when you define it, you can limit it. I think it's, um, you know, I guess I'll go Supreme Court, you know, when those things were, uh, I know it when I see it. Mm -hmm. I'm just wondering if that would help, again, help people understand uh, at what point they need to apply for uh, apply these rules so I think uh, what would help them understand is if Karen and I and probably the incoming rec director do that one-stop shopping idea for the website where we just make it really clear mm -hmm. you know on the top of our website I envision a button that just says how do I mm -hmm. and it's you go from there and it makes it easy you know what parade I just thought of we hadn't talked about it all was the Easter one that the rotary does they hold the kids they leave the school, I think, and go down Stowe to Railroad and Railroad to Pilgrim. Is that right? Yeah. Then Our understanding is they have to stay on the sidewalks when they do that. I don't know if that's how it's practiced. I don't know. I haven't done it in a couple When it's discussed, yeah. it's, we no longer can go down Main Street. We need to take that side route to not yeah. cause traffic. Right. Otherwise, it'd be a parade. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Right. Yeah. I mean, a critical distinction for me is whether you're going to close the roads or not. Right. Yeah. So if you're if you're closing the road, that's, I think, automatically a parade. If you're not closing the road, I don't believe you need our permission to assemble right. on the sidewalks. Yeah. All right. Yeah. Uh, well, I think there, it might be helpful to have that in in this uh, policy, just so we know what we're talking about. Mm -hmm. Okay. Uh, uh, Kane. Um, what did. I guess, I guess my question is, would it make it easier to enact a parade policy along with a parade permit and not alter the entertainment permit? And the, uh, the entertainment uh, ordinance. I think what you're suggesting is, um, I guess I'm a little bit unclear uh, what you mean exactly. I, th um, I, I guess what I'm saying is like instead of taking the parade policy and adding it to the mm -hmm. entertainment ordinance, we just make it its own ordinance. Just its own policy. Yeah, own standalone policy. policy. Yeah, yeah that's what I mean. That's what I was suggesting. Yeah, yeah I just introduced the entertainment ordinance as a way to say it doesn't, oh, really, okay. it doesn't really fit in any one ordinance perfectly. Sure. Okay. Which is part of the challenge. Well, that answers my question. So at the same time, if an organization came to you with an entertainment permit and it involved a parade as part of the entertainment, they would have answered these questions mm -hmm. as part of that, as part of, as per the policy. Gotcha. Same if it was a show, same if it was simply a parade, um, we, cause they need it. They need your permission to close the road. No. At the same time, we have received applications for special events, such as 100 on 100, mm -hmm. uh, and perhaps even the uh, walk to school uh, event, uh, where the roads are not closed, 
but uh, we do ask that they, uh, they they apply for for a permit, and I'm not <laughs> exactly sure which permit they're applying for, but uh, we do stipulate that they should have a uh, safety guard in place at all road yeah. crossings. And so how does, would that fit into our parade policy or another ordinance? It could, and that's part of the challenge. So we don't have an ordinance regulating special events that I could find. No, not anymore. Um, so they, we do have a special event permit that in essence they ask, they ask the select board to approve the special event. That's really based on insurance coverage. Mm -hmm. So from the staff perspective, we're making sure. We have a special, <coughs> special event permit? Permit is the wrong word. When there's a special event, we make sure there's insurance coverage named the town as additionally insured. Mm -hmm. If they're doing that event on, on public property. That's right, well we have the vendor ordinance, which they have to have a permit for, this application for a vending permit. Mm -hmm. um, that usually, that's only applicable on town property. And it's usually like somebody selling goods or selling food. Yeah. And, it, and it's not somebody at the Farmer's market, that's an entirely yeah. different oh, right. thing. So the gravel grinder came, not the gravel grinder, but there were permits associated with that yeah. event mm -hmm. for vending. Right, because there were people selling goods at the park. Yeah. Yeah. Well, I'm just wondering, uh, as Dan has sort of suggested, maybe special events is the larger category, mm -hmm. and then the vendor permit, the parade policy, and perhaps one of these others, that, oh, the entertainment uh, yeah, that's a great uh, idea. ordinance would fall under those, and you could have a decision tree mm -hmm. uh, on the website to see where where you're going to. Yeah, re and it, it is a little bit of a challenge now to sometimes figure out where to send people. Yeah, mm -hmm. Mike, that's the same. yeah, I'm sorry, Mike. Mike, Mike can you hear us. Hello? Yeah, Mike can hear. Just trying to um, unmute. Uh, question, how in the future are we going to treat like the NQID? Because like we kind of had the discussion that it's sort of like a town event, just, and, but the Rotary is sort of doing the infrastructure. Next year for NQID, are we going to have Rotary apply for a permit, even though it's kind of a quasi town event? So it's a good question. Um, probably the best way to navigate that is to have an MOU with the Rotary. We have one for, we have a, we have an old one for Rusty Parker Park that's worked well forever and a day. Um, All right. I don't think we need to get involved with running NQID because we've got a local organization that does a great job. Mm -hmm. So let's let them keep doing it. Um, Agreed, you know, and that's probably to me the, the way it should be done, you know, versus an entertainment permit, just have an M MOU on how the how Rotary could work with the town on pulling off, you know, N NQID, you know, I'm sure they would be glad to give, um, you know, discussions on road closures and stuff like that, any information that that the town needed to know. Mm -hmm. and, and, and they're the ones who essentially, uh, Al at the Rotary essentially gave us a draft parade policy. We said, Al, what do you do? And in fact, he's, they've got their own policy slash protocol that they've done for a long time. Oh, yeah. Right. Dan, and right. Dan, Mc, Dan McKibben has been the uh, NQID chairperson for Rotary, where Al's like the, is the um, park, park guru. Yeah, and Dan is here, so we'll ask him to come forward and uh, get his thoughts on the matter. Yeah, I mean, the, the scary part about an MOU is we would document all the work we're taking on by running this event year after year. Um, I, I just, I look at it from what's the least overhead for us from an execution perspective. So if, you know, filing an event permit is a, a just an additional task, um, I'm fine with doing that. If, you know, if you want to, you know, if you want to do an MOU, we can talk about that. But you know, seeing what we're doing through Rusty Parker Park, that seems like maybe more formality than we need for just an event. Yeah. Uh -huh. And for background, at least 
my understanding of the background is the big challenge here is at the Festival of Lights last year, some new staff in town. Uh, what happened is one, the road was closed way in advance of the of the parade, of the event, which didn't need to happen. And two, some of our town vehicles were parked blocking the road with no one there. And so the fire chief naturally was unhappy after that and said, if there's a fire, I gotta get through somehow. Yeah. Um, and, and if I've got to knock over a, a rack van, guess what? I'm, I'm plowing the truck into that van if I have to. Um, but he just said, you know, you, you, you need something in place to some basic rules. And, and it wasn't about an outside organization necessarily, it was about the town itself and some new staff. But it was nonetheless a good reminder that we should have some basic rules. Yeah, you know, we're we're tied off of the fire department on the planning for this parade, but I think having a discussion for such a major event in town, what you know, if it's under the you know context of an event permit that we go over before the event, I think that's reasonable. So, yeah. mm -hmm. so your preference would be to apply annually uh, for <coughs> yes. event permit? Yeah, I I think that's simpler than okay. creating an ongoing agreement. Mm. Yeah, uh, makes it clear. Uh, doesn't require a separate uh, MOU. All right. Thanks, yep. Dan. Appreciate it. Thanks for bringing that up, Mike. Do uh, you want to proceed with uh, the other? Sure. Let me just talk about a couple other issues that we, just because we reviewed them. Um, so there is a. a Ordinance to regulate uses at recreational facilities and reviewed that one and that is essentially about Not about use of the facilities, but about behavior mm -hmm. um, So there were two interesting notes in that ordinance uh, and that one's 2002 uh, So the first is it refers to page 1 section G public indecency ordinance which I have no doubt was passed at one point, but I've been unable to locate it. I was going to ask you if I could have a copy of that. So we're going to keep looking, and it might be mm. deep in the archive somewhere. Um, but it's not on our website. Yeah. I'm searching for what I could. I couldn't find anything about it yet. Um, it and not be suitable for <laughs> public discussion. It's true. Um, uh, and then the second piece. Um, on page two, under impermissible uses, I just want to point out that camping is an impermissible use hmm. uh, at our recreation facilities. Uh, so when that homeless conversation comes up, it's interesting to to know that we've effectively have an ordinance governing this already. Does that mean that uh, we uh, are, don't have the authority to uh, allow camping uh, if it's uh, requested? That means if someone's camping at a one of our recreational facilities, they're not legally doing it. So we have the authority to. But we have uh, the authority to grant an exemption uh, if uh, there's a special event and the Boy Scouts want to do a sleepover at uh, Old Davy or something like that. I, I think you certainly do. Okay. I was just going to say, can, can it be amended to just exclude camping? It's not like, you know, going to interfere with recreational activities. I think sometimes things are on the books, <laughs> and how we're enforcing yeah. them is another manner of deploying them yeah. or not enforcing them. Okay. Right. Uh, but again, didn't see a need to do any major updates to this ordinance, uh, even though it's a bit older. I will section three. Mm -hmm. I feel like we're going to get sued at some point over that, possessing firearms. I know that's a very popular opinion, but I feel like hmm. someone could potentially exercise their yeah. Second Amendment rights. Yeah. Let me dig into that. Of me, of mine. Let me dig into that a bit. I do know yeah. it's quite common for towns to not allow firearms on their own property. Right. That I just had it underlined because I was like, hmm. Yeah, but this is just <laughs> our parts, though. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Okay. 
And is the enforcement officer uh, identified? Yes. As named in the definitions section. Uh, Police so. officer, pool director, associate pool director. 2A. Oh, yeah. Okay, yeah. Um, pool director, assistant pool director, program director. What paragraph is that? Um, it's, well, I was right looking the farther down, but it's actually defined in uh, section 2A as to who the enforcement officer shall oh, mean. Oh, right here, right in front of me. Um, may I? I have another question. Uh, okay. Um, I guess this is a question for you, Tom, because I honestly don't know the answer. Can a municipality or, um, I, yeah, I guess a municipality enforce an order an order of no trespass on public property? <laughs> yes. <laughs> yes. Now, I, I, it's been done. I'm aware of a number of towns doing it. Generally, those towns had police forces. Mm -hmm. um, so it's a little bit different, but uh, you can no trespass someone from public property just as well as you can from a private business, if that's oh. part of the question. Yeah. In my judgment, it should be a little bit of a naturally higher bar. Uh, we get we get people in here who are unhappy. Uh, we'll get a number of them once tax bills go out. Mm -hmm. um, you know, they can come and they can complain about their tax bills and... and I think it'd be pretty tough to no. I just think from from my perspective, it'd be pretty tough to, to try to no no trespass someone if they if they scream and curse and threaten violence. That's one thing, but uh, I think I think people raise their voices from time to time a little bit and they they gripe about it. Um, but yeah, mm -hmm. it's pretty rare. Yeah, that was going to take you yeah. back to uh, section three uh, F for the obscene language part, that was going to be my next go-to question after the order of no trespass. Not the threatening, obviously, that, that makes sense to me, but obscene language, I guess that's undefined. It's at the discretion of... Of the enforcement, the enforcement. officer? Yeah. Mm -hmm. And a lot of this, I think, is focused on just kids at the pool, kids at the day camp. Gotcha. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> right. Different uh, situations might might call, uh, call for different uh, definitions of what yes. is Absolutely. considered obscene. Absolutely. And if it's one of our campers, there's a pretty easy solution. We can send them home. Right. Mm -hmm. Okay. Any other questions on this one? Or anything else you want to call to our attention? Nothing else in that one. Um, uh, there's a, another one, and, and this is part of our confusion. There's a recreation, which is misspe misspelled. Recreation? Recreation. Department of Parks Facilities Policy. This policy exists on the Waterbury Rec website. I downloaded the document. No, I could I could find with the same misspelling. With the same misspelling. Okay. I downloaded the document, went into the document properties, and it said document created in, in 2019. So I looked through a year's worth or even more worth of meeting minutes around the creation date of the document for both the town and for the recreation committee, uh, and found no reference to this policy anywhere. And it's not on the on the town website where adopted policies are located. So guidance. We may. It may have been, it may have been something developed by staff. And I'm waiting for, for Frank Smalling and the rec committee to see if he knows of any conversations around this in the past and he's been on the committee a while. Uh, but it's it's quite detailed. Um, to the point where you know we're talking about the sixth priority for someone who might want to use a recreational facility. Um, so a lot of effort was put into it, and I would suggest that um, it's pretty darn well written. 
And with the exception with, of the title. With the exception of the title. Which could be a program for the summer for the kids, right? Reaction, you know, you so, get out there. You... It could be purposeful. <laughs> As You're a right. general point of information, the default setting of Microsoft Word is that spell check does not spell check all caps words for anyone who might okay. be writing anything ever anywhere from so, a terrible speller. Anyway. So I would suggest, not for today, it's pretty detailed policy, but I would like to uh, forward this to the rec committee and, I, and I, I think they should have the opportunity to, to review it, massage it as they see fit, and I think they should bring to you this policy at a later date, because um, it makes perfect sense. Uh, you do at the same time have an adopted parks and facilities reservation policies, which goes part and parcel with this other one. So you can see part of our confusion here is we've got you got some intersection. Are these, are these we've got a lot of intersection. <coughs> the ordinance and the and this policy, are, is there anywhere where they conflict, where the rules are different? <coughs> if you read it closely enough, there probably is. Yeah. Um, the policy is far more detailed. The, the unadopted policy is far more detailed than the, the adopted policy. So what I think the rec committee should do is give us one. Of these two, the reservation policy and the uh, facilities policy? Because the, par the parks facility policy literally gets down to, here's our criteria for allocating our public spaces. Right. Uh, that's essentially a reservation policy, if you will. Mm -hmm. um, so reservation okay. policy is a little. So you need uh, to. Is a little more. Meld these two together. Yeah. Okay. Um, and then Karen and I can do the work about putting it on the website, and making it clear where you need to go, what you need to do. Mm -hmm. Do you need a uh, motion from us to uh, direct this to uh, the rec committee? Uh, I don't. If you're comfortable with it, I can just give it to them and. I think we can do it by consensus if everyone's agreeable. Yeah, it seems like there's a lot of really good stuff here. There's just too much of it. So I think that's a perfect path. <laughs> yeah, that's the issue. So we can at least in this case, I think, take two and create one. Mm -hmm. I did want to just point out really quickly um, with the amplified sound policy and the reservations mm -hmm. uh, written the reservation policy is exclusive to Rusty Parker for 85 decibels. Which is because there was a former village ordinance that had a sound oh, okay. limit but wouldn't apply to the rest of the town. Gotcha. If, if that's the reason I can imagine that was in there, but probably okay. should be updated. But, well. Yeah, because they they had jurisdiction uh, in Rusty Parker Park, but uh, we have other village properties uh, like right down over here, Anderson Park and uh, the uh, ice center uh, area that are also likely to have amplified sound at some point. So it sounds like um, the suggest the earlier just so I'm clear the earlier suggestion people liked was Danny's where we should um, try to write a policy that better captures the special events like the gravel grinder. Yeah. I mean, oh, sorry. I think, Tom, you and I sort of had touched on this at our meeting. It's just having that overarching special events. Um, and then, you know, I don't I don't know how far to go to. Like, is there a specific road closure permit regardless? Or do we just include closure in the different types of events? Like, if you're having a parade, you know, the road closure plans need to be in there if you're having it, whatever, you know. But... But it seems like having that umbrella and then being able to drill down within makes sense. But okay, I can uh, I can work on that. I'll probably need some help from you. Yeah, I'm gonna do it. Yeah, for me, road closure is one area. I don't know if we actually need to define it other than road closure. You know, whether it's a, a parade 
or some <coughs> other type of special event, if you're going to close the roads, then there are a set of regulations and uh, permitting, I think, that, that need to be uh, re okay. uh, re respected. So, um, so in essence, it would be a town of Waterbury parade and road closure policy. Mm -hmm. And then uh, for these other events that don't include road closure, I'm thinking that it, it's really a question of how many participants, uh, like if, or maybe a hundred or more, uh, that are going to impact uh, road crossings uh, and or you know potentially trigger a noise ordinance uh, or you know some in some way inconvenience uh, the the general use of the property uh, then there should be some type of permitting involved so Follow up to that is uh, we just had a tournament, not we, but there was just a tournament at Hope Davy, mm -hmm. which had I don't know how many people at any given time because they staggered the starts. Mm -hmm. um, but it was advertised but, as being over two hundred. Yeah, several hundred. Um, so, are you envisioning an event like that coming under this special events policy? Wouldn't impact a road. Yeah. Um, but certainly would be a pretty heavy use of a public park. Yeah, I think so, because it really does impinge the, the normal use of uh, the average Waterbury resident. Um, and, 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 oh, sorry. Go ahead, Danny. And I, you know, I think, Tom, we had touched on this as well, like that application for the special event can have an if-then component. So if you have over X amount of people, you just need to let us know what's going on and get our approval. If you have over X number of people and vendors, then you need to do your vendor thing. You know, so there's that, and I and I, it sounds overwhelming, but I think we could organize it pretty neat and clean so that when folks look at a special event, they can know, oh, I need to check off this, this, and this box, or all I need to do is say I'm having a special event and let the select board approve it. And I did take a look at the uh, Montpelier website, and there's, I mean, it, it's not the last word, but it is a uh, reasonable attempt at uh, doing sort of one-stop shop on the website, which I think really should be our goal here so that people don't have to bother Karen. They can just look on our website and say, oh, I need to do this, this, and this for what I'm planning to do. Okay. Uh, Mike. Sorry, I didn't see your hand. Uh, just, a, just a brief comment. I think it's hard with some of these events. Some of them, you just don't know how many people you're going to have in a, in a parade or a, some sort of a road closure event. You know, sometimes when you think it's going to be 50 or 100 people, it could wind up being 250 to 400 people. So I don't know how, how we deal with it. I do agree that it should, you know, any kind of road closure should fall within you know, some sort of special events, you know, for a parade or a special, you know, kind of different kind of activity that, as as I think Roger eloquently said, it impinges upon, you know, local Waterbury residents. Okay. Yeah, Alyssa. This is just a wording question. I feel like what was interesting with this recreation and facilities policy to me like seemed as you said much more like an internal rationale so to speak which i applaud us having and mm -hmm. to me isn't quite the same as like the ordinances and mm -hmm. i just am wondering and then we're using policy do you have are you using the words interchangeably or i i guess the comment is just to say like i trust you in terms of recognizing within this mix of stuff to me it feels like some is a strong ordinance that we need to be regulating that folks have certain things and some might be an internal working document for yeah. staff that if, outlines if, rationale. If it's internal working document, it shouldn't be on our website. Heard. For the public to assume it's our rules. Got it. Yep. Thank you. I, I hear what Liz is saying though. Like policy yeah. and the ordinances kind of keep getting inter intertwined. Okay. You've got all the direction you need from us? I think so. All right. So we'll keep moving it forward. All right. Thank you. Appreciate all your work on that. You're here. Um, next item on the agenda, the 2024 ARPA spending processes and review uh, survey results. And Roger, 
Um, do we have um, on Zoom Keziah Avaland? Who would be uh, our 915 for the sales tax reallocation. Okay. She sent me an email earlier today. She was feeling a little under the weather. So yeah. I'm wondering if we can swap those items. I'm happy to do so. Send her home. Well. Yeah. <laughs> well. Sure. Let's uh, move forward with the resolution to apply for sales tax re reallocation for 51 South Main Street. Is there a, uh, oh, what's I can, this? I can give a quick background on the program. Okay, please do. Uh, so it, this is, in essence, not in essence, this is a grant, ap a grant application uh, that mm -hmm. seeking your approval for. Uh, if approved, uh, the way the program works is uh, the state benefits from the first $100,000 of sales taxes purchased for the project. Uh, sales taxes beyond that can be reallocated into the project, if you will. Uh, so this will be funding to further that project, no different than the town's injection of funding. Um, <clears throat> so if you look at the um, estimated purchases um, from downstreet, um, and apply the sales tax to all of it, it'd be about $227,000 in sales taxes, according to my rough math with the first 100,000 exempt. Mm -hmm. Because I can fill in the gaps uh, that might, might work for her. I'm, I'm happy to answer uh, any questions to the best of my understanding on the, the program or the project. Um, unfortunately, Nicola couldn't be here tonight, so you guys get me, but... <laughs> um, I'm, I'm happy to, to do my best. I think you gave a, a great you know, few line synopsis of what the, the program is, but essentially it, it takes that sales tax and reinfuses it into the project in a grant form. Uh, yeah, I think, uh, I think it's a great use of uh, those funds. Uh, other questions from the board? Yeah, Alyssa. Tom, can you just repeat, is the 100000 the amount that can benefit the project? Or I'm seeing sales tax reallocation request 100000 just page one. Um, is it over the 100000 that goes? Again, just this is minor. I'm just trying to understand what you just said about the 275. Is it the 175 <coughs> over? My, my understanding from reading the program guidelines is that the first $100,000 does not benefit the project. So it goes just to the state as and it would, like if I paid sales tax correct. on goodness knows mm -hmm. what. Okay. And then beyond that, it would go back to the park. So it would flow through the town. Got it. Got it. So it's returned. So essentially that amount of sales tax form materials is returned. Okay. And you're looking okay. for a motion from us to reallocate uh, those funds to, to back to, to downstream through the funding yeah. application. Yeah. It's to have the town approve the application so that. Um, it's not just us sort of going rogue and <laughs> not working with you all through the program. Right. Alyssa. I would move to approve the 2023 sales tax reallocation program application um, from Downstreet Housing and Community Development for 51 South Main Street. Um, and I just wanted to note online that this is a benefit of us being a designated downtown. So seeing as we just made an appointment in planning and zoning who helped us get that designation many years ago and we fund revitalizing Waterbury every year, which helps. I just think it's an exciting example that we're applying for something we're eligible for specifically because we are a designated downtown. I happily second. <laughs> All right, we have a motion, moved and seconded. Any further discussion? Hearing none, all in favor say aye. 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 Any opposed? Any abstentions? All right, congratulations. Uh, this uh, 2023 sales tax or a reallocation application has been approved by the board. Thank you all so much, and I appreciate your bumping it up. <laughs> right. Thank you. Have a good night. Thank you. Thank you. All right. Now we'll go back to the ARPA spending processes and the survey results. Uh, 
which uh, Tom had forwarded uh, by email earlier. Uh, based on the last year's uh, survey uh, that went out to all the property owners uh, in town and also uh, was up on the, on our website. And this, uh, the purpose of that was to sort of guide our direction and spending, which I think we used last year uh, in uh, making the allocations uh, for the uh, 2023 budget. And uh, now we're, the last meeting we uh, approved, I think it was 26,000 in ARPA funding for the uh, purchase of uh, equipment. It's 26, uh, yeah. And uh, Kane, uh, you uh, forwarded me uh, yeah. some interesting uh, numbers uh, on uh, cooking equipment. Would you like to talk about that? Yeah, I can, I can briefly talk about that. Um, restaurants, when they're either going under or uh, liquidating old equipment, um, put it up for auction. <coughs> any restaurant in the area is going to do that. Any. Um, any, essentially, any business that uses service equipment like that is going to auction it off when they're done with it. Nobody throws away that equipment. It's expensive. Um, so I forwarded an auction to Roger um, and said, in reference to um, the senior center's request for purchasing more kitchen equipment, um, an avenue that they can possibly go through is bidding on equipment. It will come cheaper mm -hmm. through a bid, um, but that also leaves us um, not knowing how much they would be paying for it, not knowing how much to allocate for it. So they would have to win their bid for us to, to allocate the money for it. Um, otherwise, you can get all that equipment used, which is um, something I would probably need to discuss with them, um, which I have yet to do. But those are all things I looked into after our vote um, at the last meeting to try and bring that cost down a little bit while getting them the equipment that they need. Mm -hmm. yeah, part of the challenge is they don't have any, a director right now. Right. But they are operating, and they have been operating without a director for more than a year now. Um, and uh, they provide a, a, an essential service uh, to a lot of town residents. Uh, so, um, you know, I think the they're appreciative of the 26,000, um, and uh, I suggested to Kane that he forward that to them just to see if they were interested. Uh, I think part of this speaks to uh, our interest in being cost efficient uh, in the spending of ARPA funding. Um, I think Alyssa. Uh, called into question the prices of the benches uh, in uh, Karen's uh, budget for the uh, restoration of the alleyway uh, with uh, each bench costing $2,500, which, you know, it's a pretty, pretty expensive bench. And I guess on, on reflection, I too uh, wondered whether that was a, uh, uh, a naming the opportunity for fundraising. Uh, you know, you see a lot of these benches with, uh, in honor of or in memory of uh, a certain individual, and often that comes with uh, a substantial financial donation that would obviate the need for further uh, ARPA funding. Um, May I? I don't know. Yeah, sorry. <laughs> I couldn't help anybody. I was looking at the screen. Um, so in response to, so Ken, I don't know how much money would be saved, so I don't want to uh, make any assumptions, but I think it's a great idea. And also um, remembering time, you know, as a factor. So just weighing the pros and cons of how quickly something might be available to bid on versus not. And also thinking about longevity, and I, you have more expertise in the area than I do, and yeah, I still want to think about, you know, is it if we're going to save five to seven thousand dollars, but it will be less, it will, the lifespan will be 
10 years less, is that a worth it? Or, or, you know, really thinking about making that investment now to save, you know, having to reinvest partway down the line. So just things to think about on that. And, um, and then, uh, yeah, so, so since Roger, since you brought up the alleyway project, I was thinking about um, a part of this process is something that Alyssa had brought some examples of early in our conversations, which were towns who had created a community um, application. So they allocated a certain amount of money, whether it be 50,000 or 100,000, whatever it is. And um, there was a process by which community people, citizens, or organizations could apply um, for specific projects. And, and the alleyway project felt like something that would fit really well in there. Um, it would take developing an application and some criteria for, um, you know, assessment. But uh, if we put, you know, a bucket towards just that, it would be known that it was for things like art or beautification or revitalization outside of things like infrastructure and human services and housing or things like that. So I think I'm I'm a big proponent of that. I know it'll take a little bit of work, but I think it creates a nice clear process instead of, you know, sort of that feeling of flying by the seat of the pants, which which we have been for a little, little bit recently. Yeah, just that. Well, I would say certainly yes. I yes. Two different issues. Um, one, I agree definitely with uh, Kane's thing about potentially buying equipment at auction. And the way you could do, do that with them is, you know, the, you know, auction, you know, as a lot of, you know, restaurants, you know, it's probably one of the most fragile businesses that there are so there are a lot of failures so there is a lot of actually good equipment out on the market what we could do is give the senior center kind of an up to amount so they could go in it with eyes eyes wide open so we could say you know we're willing to give you so much and that's where they know where their bidding can be so if it goes above that you know they may want to look at another auction as to the question about the uh, the walkway and the alley project, I don't believe, you know, I'm on the uh, fundraising committee for revitalizing Waterbury in regards to the alley project. And I don't believe that the actual cost of those benches are $2,500 each. They're probably closer to, you know, $1,000. You know, that's, I think, more for, you know, we're looking at, at folks that can donate that amount toward the whole project. And the good part about it is the alley project is, you know, about 50% funded already, which I think is a very positive thing. So, you know, that's going to encourage donors, but, you know, we had a lot of conversations as to, you know, should we have uh, benches named and stuff like that. We didn't want to get into a situation where, you know, every little piece of the alley was going to be, you know, having like quote naming rights. So that's still a, a work in work in progress. You've sold a lot of bricks already. Um, so a lot of pieces. Sold. Right. The bricks are something that's really separate. That's already been done. You know, that's going to acknowledge things, but I think what we're going to be looking at is some sort of a plaque to acknowledge, you know, donors at different at different giving letters rather than, you know, having, you know, this much for a planter, this much for a uh, bench, this much for, you know, a sign on the wall. And, I, you know, I think that's still a work in progress with the fundraising committee. And what, I have one question, Mike, sorry, um, about uh, in closing, uh, Karen said that she thought that the project would be going on for another two years, uh, almost regardless of whether we gave her the 20 or not. Um, is that your understanding? I mean, I, I guess. I think that's a long a real long run. Yes, if they can't raise the money, they don't, you know, they don't want to go forward. But I think, you know, they're looking at 
this year and max next almost for looking at construction and sometime in 2024 but yes they have to have the funds before they could go forward so if the fundraising doesn't go the way that they predict you know again they're 50 percent in the good and that's where in the and that's what i stressed in their fundraising letter they should state that because a lot of people don't want to give to a project unless they really feel the project is going to happen and that that's one of the reasons why i said because they say you know they use you know a little nebulous like a significant amount of funds i said no you want to say that we have raised half of the money already so you know people will know this is a project that's going forward. Yeah, I mean, you're speaking directly to my concern. Uh, I don't want to uh, invest $20,000 of ARPA funding in a project that's not gonna happen. Right. And I think this is going to, you know, again, being at the 50% level, I agree. I don't wanna have, have it, but I think, you know, the next step, in the fundraising committee is going out with fundraising letters. We're really going after not the mom and pop donors, but big dollar donors. And to make this happen, you know, having different levels. And, you know, I can't say it's a hundred percent going to happen, but the way, you know, once it goes out to, you know, the fundraising committee and there's an, uh, an effort, I would think this is going to, truly happen in a relatively expeditious time, but I could be wrong. Okay. The one piece I want to add to that, Roger, mm -hmm. um, I've had a few conversations about this project and I've suggested that if, if they're relatively close um, and don't want to miss a construction season, that a loan through EFUD, through their loan fund, would be a in essence, a construction loan. Uh, mm -hmm. Most of those loans are term loans, you know, five years, 10 years. In this mm -hmm. case, I've talked to some, you know, different people on the EFUD board suggested if they're pretty close, they're a trusted organization, I think they've got the ability to raise the funds. We could get them across the finish line um, with a loan, and it would be, you know, something like an interest only loan, pay back the funds as you raise them. Mm -hmm. um, I think the cost would arise if we miss the construction season next year, and then there's going to be, you know, take it all and add eight percent, ten percent. Right. Yeah. So we want to avoid that inflation. Um, okay. Well, um, Danny suggested that we set aside. So I'm sorry. Yeah. yeah. I mean, if you want to go generally before, I I'm probably going the same direction as you, but I guess I just wanted to say kind of that like zooming out um, of I applaud. You know, I guess I would say one, I think my comment with RW was specific, but I appreciated Danny's framing to kind of take it to a higher level about kind of what proposed uses of ARPA are. Um, uh -huh. In response to the survey, just reiterating, we have committed funds already, in fact, too many of these top categories. I mean, when we look and see infrastructure was category number one, right. $435,000 for town bridges last year, $150,000 to EFUD, you know, the gravel, road initiative, all of that is looking to, I have Tom's spreadsheet um, mm -hmm. of stuff and pulled up the town report. I just, just my overall framing is kind of like, there's two pieces. There's one, how we have already spent and committed ARPA funding, mm -hmm. which was informed by and really aligns with a lot of the top categories. You see housing is on here for number three. Again, we allocated fund to funding to Downstreet. Um, I think Danny really named the one instinct I had around um, again, community organizations and recognizing we did have CB Fiber and WASI and EFUD and Downstreet who have worked really closely with the municipality as has revitalizing Waterbury. But, you know, we had Spring Hill School and we said no, but they only asked because they were asking other towns. Right. And so there wasn't kind of an open call or invitation. So I would just say generally that appeals to me depending on where reappraisal lands, it looks like we're in the, you know, four to $500,000 kind of remaining. So at least a portion of that being available in general. Um, and then more specifically, again, I did make the comment about the benches, but I also would say, I think it's that balance of, I don't want to be nickel and diming. And so I appreciate the comments just about cost implications and used equipment, particularly with like volunteer organizations um, and just wanting to weigh both. Um, 
And so for the RW project, you know, it's a public project in a public space and, and how to figure out a way to support that, I think also maybe outside of ARPA, I don't know if we have other, I know that was one of the follow-up conversations just around, is there other ways of providing municipal support um, to that project outside of just a cash contribution? Mm -hmm. Sorry, that was rambly. Yeah, no, that's fine. And uh, the, the, you, particularly your last comment uh, <laughs> did uh, remind me of a question I had for Tom, which was, a substantial portion of their budget was the uh, preparation of the, of the site. Uh, I think it was like fifty thousand uh, dollars, and I'm wondering if it's conceivable that the town highway department would be able to contribute any in-kind services uh, to uh, knock down that cost. Yeah, yeah, I need to go over that with them in some detail, but it's possible. Mm -hmm. Because, I mean, that would be, uh, according to, to the budget, and again, the budget may not be exact, uh, that would be a, a contribution of, of well over, uh, depending on how much the town could do, it would be uh, well over the value that she applied for. Yeah, I love that idea. That's a great idea. Like, that, seems, that seems like a better contribution from us than just handing them cash. It's just doing part of the work. We certainly could. Uh, we've also, um, it's essentially a public walkway when it's done, so we'll pay the bill for the street lights. Uh, we'll deal with the trash. Uh, we'll help where we can with snow clearing. So uh, could you, Tom, sort of itemize uh, what the town would be able to contribute towards the, those uh, site costs? Sure. And, uh, and also, of course, discuss it with Karen because she may have already lined up providers of, of some of those. Uh, but um, that, I think, uh, would, would, as Kane says, uh, make us feel as though we're contributing without mm -hmm. necessarily cutting into uh, what could be scarce uh, financial resources uh, going forward. Sure. Uh, yeah, Mike. I don't know if this makes a difference. I know I've been, you know, pretty involved with the uh, alley project, but please realize that alley is, I guess, private property. It's not town property. I know we would look at it as kind of a walkway, but I don't know how that would affect our contribution in terms of doing things with, you know, public, you know, public, you know, the public works, you know, resources. I, you know, I'm all for doing that, but I just, you know, because it is private property, I don't know how, how that, maybe if Tom could comment on that. Yeah, it's private property, um, but Karen, uh, Karen's organization has an MOU uh, with them. Uh, we've all, I've also already agreed to add it to our insurance and there's a way for us to assign the liability to us. So it's it's private, but it's really quasi public, mm -hmm. um, and that's what attorneys totally and that's what attorneys are for. Mm -hmm. and, and the MOU uh, provides for public access, right? Yeah, yeah. So I'm I'm pretty comfortable with it. Alyssa. Um, Roger, I'd say one of the things I most appreciate U.S. Chair is being really good about timelines. And I guess one of the things that has come up, no, both in asking about next steps, candidly, um, that has come up on this alley project, candidly, as a concern was the perspective timeline. But in this spirit of, again, Danny and I, I'm not speaking for the board, but talked about this idea of community organizations. Again, we have the senior center in the wings hoping to kind of address the more imminent mm -hmm. needs. But thinking to the future, I guess, I have a question around, does the board in general have interest in some sort of community application process? Does staff have concerns and what that timing might be? Again, looking to kind of right. mid-year 2023, but into next year, um, and wondering if we you know, do some preliminary, preliminary discussing now or add it to our next agenda in terms of defining a process, thinking that for RW or others saying, you know, we're going to have an additional round. And again, I'm not saying we might have other ARPA uses. I mean, I'm noting that recreation is here and that, you know, we have recreation studies and different things that have happened and, and didn't maybe dig into those ideas as a board. But um, so, 
I can comment on that. So a couple of meetings back, Kane had actually asked about ARPA funds, about the debt ceiling, because that had come mm. up. Um, and as it turned out, um, from that perspective, the funds were considered allocated once right. they made it to us. Um, so we have until uh, next summer to allocate the funds in a couple of years to spend them. But what we can do, and I could prepare this for your next meeting, is I could prepare you a resolution that, from the federal government's perspective, allocates and spend the funds. We allocate and spend them into our back pocket. Into a, they're really in our left pocket. Now we move them to the right. Mm -hmm. So you can still go forward with a community process over time, but you can take your time. Uh, and in theory, that could take five years if you wanted to. So that's something that you could do. We could still call it ARPA to keep the you know keep the, the verbiage we've been using. Mm -hmm. um, but that would take some some time pressure off if you were feeling that. Yep. May as well. <laughs> <laughs> I like that idea. Yeah. Um, at the same time, uh, I, I do think, uh, you know, just in immediate term, uh, we've uh, budgeted uh, till 9.45 uh, tonight to uh, discuss this, which means that we've got approximately 55 minutes left. Uh, so uh, we do have time to discuss this further. And um, I like the idea of uh, developing a process for community organizations. Uh, in all likelihood, we'll continue to get requests from the likes of RW and uh, the uh, Senior Center uh, for, for these funds. Uh, and so I think clarifying the process by which uh, they would apply for them uh, makes a lot of sense to me. Can I throw a couple other things out there? Please do. Um, so as part of the Hope Davy study, Monica Callan and a few others have talked about public art. Um, uh -huh. I had a meeting a little while back with Waterbury Arts, um, and they talked about similar concepts. No project yet, per se, uh, but just talked about the idea of expanding public art throughout town. Mm -hmm. um, the, the park study um, calls for some town investments, for sure. Now, that'll be likely on your July 17th agenda. Um, and the short-term investments that come to mind uh, are some of the ADA improvements that were discussed in the study. Mm -hmm. And I think we're, we're noted by the study group as a higher priority. Um, and then finally, soon enough, I'll have some results uh, from Alec Tuscany and his analysis of the pool. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So just a couple themes to think about. And there's always the roads and bridges. Yeah. Yeah. Which we're, will be never ending, right? Never ending. Alyssa. Well, just to throw something out there, I mean, I will say one thing that we had in the report last year was this reappraisal funding. I know we keep revisiting it, and I don't mean to beat a dead horse, but I would say it's $200,000. So to me, that might be like, an interesting bucket of money to think about well, more creatively recognizing that there might be other apt uses but yeah. thinking about you know community projects and again not designing tonight right. but thinking about you know to me the exciting opportunity of a community application form is just like you don't know what's out there until you put something out like that and i think there could be some potential small projects that a small investment could really make a difference mm -hmm. um i think in terms of the um, allocation, you know, makes sense in terms of if it's going to help with compliance and also thinking about for community orgs, hopefully that would help take away strings. I do think we have, there's some general public knowledge of ARPA, so to the extent we can work sooner than later, I do think it's a nomenclature that's known right now mm -hmm. um, as a resource that exists. So I think it's wonderful that we potentially have an opportunity to, you know, be thoughtful, but also think that there isn't a need to wait unnecessarily if we feel comfortable moving forward, even if we have it kind of off the books technically. Mm -hmm. And Kane, you've expressed concern about uh, <coughs> what might be considered more of a vanity 
project uh, as uh, opposed to a more utilitarian. One. Yeah, um, f from my, I guess, perspective, from my reading about ARPA funding and the way other towns and cities have been spending theirs, everyone does it different, so there's not really a whole lot to go off of. No one does it the same way. Um, so as far as those statistics are concerned, uh, you know, most other towns were just shooting in the dark. They're spending a lot of their ARPA funding on whatever they wanted. Um, some of it was, so, you know, some towns and cities were, you know, they would do things like the senior center. They'd uh, benefit homeless shelters. And some cities were spending them on giant paintings on the sides of buildings. Uh, so uh, I guess past comments that I've made regarding ARPA funds are kind of dead in the water. Um, in that regard, <laughs> um, but I, I still do believe that um, it need you know that money should be spent on um, making sure that Waterbury is a, a a place to live for all people. It's still affordable for people, seniors included, young people included, anyone who wants to move to Waterbury. Um, and I do think that a project like the Alleyway Project would be beneficial in reaching this goal. Um, I just think if we can benefit them in another way other than just handing them cash, if we could help them some other way, I think that would be a better start for us. All right. Um, Jane. Yeah, hi. Um, a few years ago when I was on the select board, uh, we did a, I participated in a scoping study for a sidewalk that was uh, so a scoping study was like a feasibility study with the Agency of Transportation um, that's required before you actually apply for funding for a project. You have to do a conceptual plan and a feasibility study and hire designers. So at that time, it must be at least five or six years ago now, uh, the so select board, okay, the sidewalk was from the corner of Stowe Street up to um, up to uh, Colbyville, and you know um, we came up with a plan, and it um, it's just sitting on the shelf. So at the time, we talked about chunking it into like four or five different sections to be built. And I guess this authorization, are you, it's been approved to move ahead, at least to straighten out when that bridge gets redone at the corner of Stowe Street. Um, that's a start on this whole thing. Um, but anyway, that's just like one other, here's a need, you know, a, a need, is it a need? It seems like it's a need to have safe uh, ability to walk from Stowe Street up to Colbyville uh, on a sidewalk, but I mean, I, you know, I don't know, you have to decide yourself if you want to fund something like that, but um, if these feasibility city studies that are paid for, um, you know, in good, good faith to sit around for too long, they're really not worth anything anymore. After 10 or 15 years, you have to rescope the whole thing because things change and budgets change and everything. So I'm just putting that out there because it seems like it's something that's kind of fallen to the wayside. And um, just want to point out that Pedestrian, pedestrian needs are, are uh, important too. Yeah. Am I dreaming or was there a commitment by Shaw's to uh, contribute to the construction? I'm having trouble hearing you. I'm sorry. Am I dreaming or uh, did Shaw's commit to contributing to that sidewalk? Uh, Way back when Shaw's was built, they contributed, they said they would pay something like $20,000 for a sidewalk. For kind of walkway improvements. I, I don't know if that was ever, I don't know what ever happened to that lofty uh, commitment. <laughs> it's not very much money. Right? Yeah, it's not It's not going to build a sidewalk necessarily, but it's something. Um, okay, okay. Yeah. thank I, you. I don't know what that, where that stands quite a while ago. Yeah. I just wanted to point that out there. So. No, I appreciate um, it. And I, and I, there's a lot of other pedestrian needs around town too. Mm -hmm. And, and I know that the pedestrian, a new pedestrian walkway is part of that uh, yeah. um, bridge, new bridge design. Um, yes. 
It's one piece of it. One piece of it, right. Alyssa. All right. My follow-up was actually for Jane. Do you remember the other barrier? It didn't have to do with the timing of VTrans redoing the 100 and So Street intersection. I just remember the whole thing was scoped, and then there was some challenge where either the lights need to be upgraded, or am I, am I misremembering? <coughs> but I thought there was some other barrier. And then there was a concern with the grade of the proposed sidewalk going up to the Best Western that they thought the town wouldn't be able to maintain with current equipment. I'll just say, like, anecdotally, yes, the intersection of <laughs> Sir Street and Route 100, I see people running across, and it's terrifying. And I remember, mm -hmm. I think, at the time, a $435,000 yeah. price tag, which yeah. is not insignificant. Um, so I appreciate you raising um, it. And again, we don't need to get into tonight, but just to say, I no, think there I think the whole thing should be dusted off and looked at and, and you know, does it, does it suit needs or not? You know, it's just, it is an important area. It included a, a way to cross Route 100, which was tricky because of uh, traffic and site distance and the, the crossing, potential crossing was um, at the other hotel there um, across from the bank. A little, yeah. So anyway, thank you. Thank you. Thanks, Jane. I'm gonna bow out. All right. Appreciate your input. Thank you. Um, I guess you know certainly uh, one of the things that uh, Alyssa brought up was uh, the fact that we have this two hundred thousand dollar question mark which is a significant amount of money. Um, and I'm just wondering uh, if we might revisit now how much money we've got and then what we might potentially have if uh, the state decides to take over the uh, re-assessment uh, of uh, town properties. And then, uh, you know, Tom, you brought up a bunch of potential projects that would be amenable to, to ARPA funding. Uh, if that could perhaps serve as a guide over the next month mm -hmm. for us to sort of identify where, potentially where, where this ARPA money would go and then how much we might have for community projects because I don't think we want to overstate our capacity to fund something sure. and invite 100 people to 100 organizations to come forward if we only have $25,000 left to spend. Alyssa. And I think to change why, I think, I mean, we can also be selective. You know, I threw out 200,000, but then in my head, I'm going, oh, well, if the sidewalk is that's, you know, I think we have the ability to create parameters around that bucket, you know, in the right. context of how much we have overall and other priorities. Yeah. And, you know, for example, we might say invite community organizations to come forward with proposals up to 25,000. Exactly. Uh, for projects concerning beautification, improved access, uh, or that type of thing. Would we consider like tiering it or, or, or um, specializing it? So we have like a tier for, for you know, beautification. We'd have a tier for um, like, I guess I could, I'm just throwing it out there. It's not, you know, relevant, but like a community garden and, and things like that like things that um not it was just an example um mm -hmm. well just and then like sort of the same, um, same category from my mind and then i'm gonna throw this one out there maybe you know something for if we eventually need like a houselessness project of some kind um mm -hmm. would we have like these different tiers for different projects um instead of just throwing them all in the same bucket and having them vie for this cash that you know, that was my idea. Uh huh. Um, Danny, you had mentioned the uh, application form. Was there a, a town that you saw that had an application form that you think we should look at? Um, yes, and I don't have it pulled up. Um, there are ones I had saved. Um, maybe in an email, but it would take me probably a couple of minutes to pull up. You can just forward those to me. Have them, Melissa. Yeah, I can do. Milton was excellent. Right. Yeah, you said, I think you're the one who sent me the list, so it would be from you. <laughs>
Uh, they had one, yeah. I uh, also am noting, I'm on their page right now, mm -hmm. um, that they passed a resolution outlining how the ARPA funds are allocated, and we had that content. Tom provided it, it in the town report, but I'm just saying out loud, I thought it was an interesting mechanism to really like articulate the rationale between, behind the spending. So mm -hmm. it's not something we've typically done, but I thought it was interesting. Yeah. Mike? Maybe, maybe I'm out to lunch, but you could all tell me so. But didn't we do our survey that uh, gave us an outline of what people want in this town? And I think we should, you know, you know, that was a pretty extensive survey. And I think we should, you know, honor that, that survey as to what the folks in the town want to do. You know, we can't be everything to everyone. And... I don't know. That's a fiscal conservative of me. We, you know, the people have spoken, you know, kind of what they thought were important goals. And I'm not saying we should stick to that 100, 100 percent, but we should really try to honor that process. That's all I have to say. Mm -hmm. well, I think uh, we respect that. And as uh, Alyssa pointed out, I think we did respect that uh, in the allocations uh, when we went through this at the end of last year, um, but I think it's uh, worthy to uh, point it out again that, that the, the town has generally expressed their uh, preferences. Um, I'll just uh, add one other thing that uh, the um, rec committee has also developed a uh, rubric for prioritizing uh, rec projects. And this is relevant in part because uh, they're going to be using those to prioritize what they bring to us for funding. Um, and uh, so that's yet another sort of screen with which we're using to, to prioritize. And part of that is the, the degree to which it, it benefits uh, a large number of people, um, which I think is, is worthy of consideration. Um, and uh, so, you know, while the town has said uh, they, they want to prioritize number one infrastructure. Uh, it might help us to identify types of infrastructure, infrastructure that are going to benefit a larger percentage of the town. And other ones. Yeah, Kane. Um, I, I agree completely with you on that. But I, uh, I agree with Mike. A little bit as well so we can just build a top three on this list and if we were to further poke and prod you know infrastructure housing and recreational resources um, we can just take those top three and go from there and ask the community once again um, in, in those three categories what is most important obviously housing is its own like you can't you can uncategorize it, but like what kind of housing are they speaking about when it's infrastructure? What bridges are you talking about when it's recreational resources? What, what fields, what trails are they talking about? Um, and then we can definitely have a perfect understanding of what the community wants if we do it that way. Uh, Danny, and then Alyssa. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think kind of kind of evolving that idea a little bit. We had a, some feedback uh, in this regard as well. Is is rather than that open ended question of like give some examples, give some possibilities. If we, uh, you know, this is our work along with the staff's work. Is you know what have we identified and can we give them you know three options in the sidewalk category, in the road category? You know, I think. There, you know, we can always leave that open-ended other and and open to suggestions. But 
if I was just, you know, myself and was not super involved and know what was going on, I wouldn't know where to start, but I would still want to offer my voice. So if we could propose, you know, some of the priorities that we might have in mind um, and just make it a little bit easier for folks to feel like they have enough information to weigh in, I think would be more beneficial. Um, and then I forgot my second thing. So carry on. <laughs> Alyssa. And I guess adding to Danny's points, I just want to recognize for infrastructure, I think I, personally, I value very significantly staff input on infrastructure. I feel like the municipality and EFUD are the infrastructure entities in town. They're the ones with a stable of projects. So just acknowledging like, you know, a citizen may have interest in the infrastructure outside their home for whatever particular reason, but candidly, the reason I supported the bridge recommendation is that it was a recommendation from Tom and Alec and staff with a long-term history in the municipality. So in vetting what a valuable infrastructure investment would be, I weighted their input very heavily personally. So it's not that I don't wanna, I think it is really wonderful that we have this thumbs up from the community. The way we did the survey, I mean, it was just a question of among these buckets, which would you prefer? And candidly, we didn't have an other community investment bucket. I was on the board at the time. I think also some things have evolved. We have this piece around the quarry. We ended up budgeting general funds, not ARPA funds to fulfill that need. So I don't disagree, but I think I would hate to be limited just to those three. I mean, we could choose to do it. I think it's a question of scale. Like, and again, that's why I said the 200 and now I'm talking myself maybe down to 100,000. I think we can honor the intention to have those be the most important investments and have a once in a generation opportunity to have funding just because candidly, I don't envision in a future time in the select board being able to say this is an open call. I do think having the priorities is really great because I think one piece of feedback we did get is this letter felt like we have free money. Like, how do you want to spend it? It's a party. So I think rooting it in the goals of the board and how it furthers community priorities is a really great framing versus just like, what could you do with, you know, money? Yeah. And I'll just add to that that uh, I think it is a good opportunity to uh, take advantage of the fact that we do have uh, a number of different uh, committees serving the town uh, that have deliberated over these issues uh, so that the rec committee has been looking at a prioritization list for, for years now uh, and has had several discussions and has a lot more involvement, understanding of these issues than, than certainly I do. Uh, so getting that recommendation from them uh, and uh, 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 you know that we have now have a housing task force uh, that's looking at prioritization of different issues and I would respect you know their due diligence uh, on something like this as well. Next steps. So, <laughs> next steps. Um, again, I'll, uh, I'll suggest that we uh, take a look and then maybe we can do part of that right now, just uh, identifying how much money we, we've got and uh, prospective projects uh, in some of the priority uh, initiatives that, that uh, Tom has just uh, identified. Yes, yeah, so I can tell you quickly. Mm -hmm. um, You've got about 300,000 if the reappraisal piece is put back into that pot that was $200,000 allocated. Mm -hmm. So call it a half a million in rough numbers. There's a $26,000 commitment to the senior center. We'd subtract out of that. Um, although we might be able to find a way to do that better. Um, and you haven't made a formal commitment yet to RW for the LA way. Right. So, about four seventy five, and is a good good to think about in rough numbers. Um, um, your understanding of the uh, reappraisal situation is that the town, uh, that the state is uh, doing a study on this, uh, and uh, any idea which which way the study uh, is likely to go. Um, I think it makes fundamental sense for the state to take this over. Mm -hmm. 
um, and to do it on a regional basis. Um, I think the study will say that. I'm hoping that um, by this time next year, the process is done and there's a bill that's passed. Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, and we're going to uh, ideally get uh, a uh, presentation by the SE committee on the 17th of July yes. on their recommendations. Um, and uh, I think part of that will also uh, um, include some indication of prioritization from the uh, from the rec committee. Yes. Uh, so we will have potentially some ideas on, on rec projects. Uh, and I mean, the problem with infrastructure is that any bridge uh, would likely absorb three fourths of this money, uh, or all of it. Or all of it. <laughs> yes, uh, the pool could absorb all the uh -huh. all the money. Um, right. Yeah. So, <laughs> which, which would make an easy decision. We just wipe wipe this balance right off the, the sheet. Uh, but uh, maybe we should just. Uh, <coughs> If we could ask you to bring forward a couple of those, I don't know if the pool will be uh, have a price tag set to it. It'll be, it'll be quite ready by then at that level, but hopefully mm -hmm. we'll have something. Um, yeah, I can bring forward plenty of those ideas. That won't be a problem. Mm -hmm. All right. And I think maybe uh, we can put it on the agenda, uh, maybe towards the end of that evening. And that might help us decide whether we even are going to be in a position to open up uh, a community fund or whether, whether that makes any sense whatsoever. Yeah. Well, something I'm beginning to think of during the course of this meeting, um, it would be the town doesn't have, um, hasn't had for a while any sort of formal capital improvement plan adopted by the select board. Mm -hmm. um, that's, <coughs> that's essentially what we're starting to talk about here. Right. Um, so I can sort of start that for recreation and some other projects for next month. Um, but we should think of it um, also as potentially a, a bridge to a local option tax that we can pretty quickly, I can pretty quickly come up with a plan that um, looks out three, four, five years, depending on the category, um, and requires many millions beyond what we have. Um, mm -hmm. But if a local option tax is a possibility, that's it's a little less aspirational, a little more realistic to do some of those things. Okay. So in a way, this process could be the process that mm -hmm. happens all the time. Mm -hmm. And we are anticipating that the local auction tax will be on the proposed charter and that you're uh, getting a legal uh, opinion of the language on that. Okay. Uh, any further discussion on tonight's? Anyone feel like we need further um, clarification as to next steps? Hearing none. Okay. Um, then I guess we're ready to discuss the agenda for uh, the next. Well, the next meeting, which has already been warned, is going to be at five thirty on Wednesday, the twenty eighth, which is a week from next uh, day after tomorrow. And then we'll have uh, the training on uh, inclusion for Wednesday night and Thursday night. Um, that will be with EFUD and the chairs of the uh, town committees. Correct? And Two uh, hours each? Yes. Okay. And to quickly preview the next meeting, which is just the meeting to adopt the tax rate. Mm -hmm. 
uh, Dan Sweet or Lister sent me today the, the 411, which is the form that uh, essentially is the current grant list. Mm -hmm. um, and that form, using the estimated tax rate in the budget, gets us uh, slightly ahead of our budget for taxes, which is where you want to be, to the tune of five or six grand. So Oof. we're not just um, scraping it. Right we're just scraping it, but last year we were, I believe, about $35,000 behind. Mm -hmm. So just scraping it, I think, is pretty fair. Um, if you mm -hmm. scrape too much and at some point, you know, you, you went too high in your rate. Mm -hmm. um, it's good to be in the good side of things, even if we're scraping it. Yeah, yeah unfortunately, um, if I can just piggyback that, your grievance hearings aren't until the 30th. <coughs> so you're going to be looking at an abstract grant list that doesn't take into account the grievance hearings. Yeah. Which will change, ultimately. Okay. And, and Dan has the legal authority to make some adjustments during those hearings. Um, I was talking to Dan this morning, and the, the trend that you see in the in the grievance world is, um, you know, we're we're below that eighty percent threshold of, in essence, our values compared to the market. So if you if you built a house in Waterbury in the past year, you're going to get a number from our lister that looks low to you. So you're probably not going to grieve the fact that our number is lower than what you paid to build your house or buy your house. Right. Um, <laughs> After you reappraise, that you're on the other side of that coin, you get a lot of grievances. Yeah. Um, but I think right now we'll be we'll generally be okay. Um, yeah. And, and a lot of grievances, in my experience, um, someone comes in and you know they say my you know you've got my house worth three fifty. I think it should be three forty five. So even if there's an adjustment made, it's it's not going to have a huge impact on the cut deeply line. into our pocket. That's nice. Uh, do we also want to invite uh, Monica Callen if she's available uh, and see if she's interested in either of those two positions at this uh, meeting on the 28th? Uh, I'm just saying that because I feel as though the meeting on the 17th is going to be pretty well charged, but we can maybe determine that after we take a look at uh, what's already on the list for the 17th. I think that's a good idea. All right. Could we ask Mona if she's interested in either of the two remaining positions uh, with Central Vermont uh, Regional Planning? And if so, uh, if she would care to uh, present, and we'll put her at the top of the uh, agenda. Thank you. All right, and then on the 17th, what, is, what have we got so I think far? We passed 54 and a half, and that's mm. a sense tax rate. That's <laughs> what it's based on. Thank you. Yeah. There we go. Got uh, MOU with the Rotary Club. Um, however, they said they don't want an MOU. Is that the uh, same MOU or a different one? <laughs> a different one. The, the Rotary Club at their last meeting, and I believe Mike knows about it, was there, um, adopted an MOU about Rusty Parker. Oh, okay. Uh, my understanding the is... Care and feeding of Rusty Parker Park? Yeah, their, their board chair came by. It took him a while to adopt that MOU. They were a little concerned about uh, committing to things that they can't live up to in the future, given there's, you know, a small cadre that does a lot of work. Yeah, uh, like Al Lewis. Yeah. <clears throat> so I told them tentatively, let's let's try to see if we can uh, get that on the agenda for the 17th. But I will fully admit I have yet to read the MOU. <coughs> okay. All right. Just a little addendum to, to that. Um, yes, there was a little consternation by the Rotary about the MOU more that they're concerned because you don't create people like Al Lewis every day. And Al's been for like 40 years caretaking that park. And I think the Rotary was more concerned about, you know, you know, what they might eventually have 
long term if they can fulfill some things. And, you know, I explain this is just kind of a framework and they're going to do what they can do. The problem is they realize that there are some things at the town that are not directly re related to Rotary. You know, they're good for, you know, start up and tear down of the gazebo, the concerts in the park and stuff, but they can't, you know, they can't maintain every event that happens at, at Rust Street Park or Park. And that's going to be, that, that was a real concerning point. And I had to do a little bit of a sales job because I, I think it's really important that the town has a MOU with Rotary that kind of, you know, spells out what each party is going to do. And we made it to be, you know, a 60, a 60 day, you know, exit contracts say they can't do that, that it doesn't bind Rotary into kind of perpetually, you know, taking care of the park stuff that they can't manage. That's all. Yeah. Probably a good time to, to take a look at it, uh, given the transfer of uh, ownership. And, you know, I guess I, I did question even last year why Al Lewis was holding the keys to uh, the pavilion. But, uh, you know, again, if, if Rory wants to do this, that's great. But uh, it's probably getting to the point where they're no longer able to do as much as they have in the past. 100% right, Roger. Well, okay, good. Well, it'll be good to review that. Um, SE group presentation, uh, I imagine that's going to require some time. It's going to require some time and, and um, something to consider. Um, I talked to the SE group last week and I mentioned that they're at the steering committee. Maybe we should try to target the 17th. Um, you may want to consider as a board having a special meeting with just the SE group because I'm fearful that it's going to be not fearful. I, th I expect there's going to be a fair amount of public comment related to that report and it that's fine. It may, we should either just plan for the 17th probably to run awful late if that's the case or maybe but I think a special meeting might be a mm -hmm. good idea in this case. They're certainly not going to argue if you want to give them another week. Um, well, if we give them another week, then we'd have to give them another two or three weeks uh, because uh, that would be the next time we meet would be sometime early in August. Um, I mean, we, can we can certainly plan for it. I just um, I guess for that one, it's a little hard to anticipate how much time we'll need, but I expect it might be a big At chance. least an hour, yeah. I would expect. But we may have time. I don't think there'll be a lot of controversy about the uh, MOU with Rotary and if there is we can probably allow that one to slide for two weeks. Um, how about the charter? The charter um, shouldn't be too complex. The language around the local option tax is, is fairly simple. Um, the language around the manager's appointment authority is also fairly simple. I'd just like to have an attorney uh, review that. Um, I sent it to the uh, League of Cities and Towns where there's a free legal review. Um, and in essence, he he blessed the language, but he, he raised some questions based on some experiences in other towns. If I wanted to kick that up and spend a little bit of money, and I'm going to um, play phone tag with a guy named Jim Barlow, who's, uh, who's an attorney who really specializes in this sort of work. Um, not general counsel, he's more really a specialty in, in laws, charter language, things like that. Um, it's not going to take hours and hours of Jim's time, but it'd be nice to have a memo to him mm -hmm. outlining, telling us we're on, we're on the appropriate ground. Great. How long I would think 15 to 20 15? minutes. Yeah. Presentation of financials from the auditors. I think 15 minutes would be would be plenty. Okay. And you like the position of these at the end of the meeting? Um, well, you, you have tree care ordinance and then I think you said something about recreation and infrastructure costs. We are both on the investment. Very good. Are you coming back at that meeting with that? 
that's at a minimum should be in the in the parking lot. Oh, okay. Um, I think it's a matter of whether or not we think we have time on the 17th. <coughs> From my perspective, I'm here, so I'm not the one arguing time. Um, yeah, I think that the tree care ordinance is uh, uh, ready to go. We'd be in a position to move that through without a lot of uh, time, but 10 minutes. <coughs> And maybe that should go above uh, charter. Yeah, this was really just a collection of things. That yeah, I get it. Sure. But yeah, I mean, I think most people will be there for the uh, presentation by the SE group. Mm -hmm. uh, so put that first. So, so yeah, let's just yeah. put that first and bite the bullet right away rather than keeping everyone on <coughs> tender hooks and then uh, we'll then we can take up the rotary club and then the tree care ordinance uh, the charter and the presentation of the fi uh, financials Are you inviting the auditors to come so you oh uh, really the auditors have to come okay then we need yeah, the auditors of course I want them last yeah well now they're turning <laughs> yeah, we're going to sit here <laughs> Uh, yeah, no, I, I, I'm I sure, thought this I'm sure was, they'll zoom in. I thought this was just, oh, they'll just zoom in and they don't care what time? They might care, but they, they work for us in the end, so we can figure that out. Or we time. can put them at the first meeting in August. Oh. Um, yeah, I don't think they're going to want to listen to the SE group presentation. Um, Could we put them before the Rotary Club? Um, or you, like Rogers, or you just said move up to August and just give yourself more time for a secret. Yeah, I'd say let's, let's move them to August. I mean, this is this is nothing that's going to change uh, between uh, mid July and uh, beginning of August. We have parking lotted unhoused people. Hmm. Do we have updates on that. Uh, yeah, the big update is the, uh, so the state, I believe today was the first day of their veto session, and that's that's the open-ended issue in the state budget. And mm -hmm. so the, uh, the pretty substantial number of people that will run out of housing as of June 30th, I think, are still in some limbo, and it sounds like the state is working to, legislature is working to continue the program. Mm -hmm. um, I'm not sure at what level, for how long. Um, but that's the major topic. Um, <clears throat> continue to have conversations with, with a number of folks about this. And um, every indication is that everyone who's an expert in this field, I would say, is telling me that you shouldn't expect um, any substantial impact on Waterbury, even if on June 30th the, the hotel program ends, uh, that the, the the individuals impacted are flocking to where their services. So Barry Montpelier are disproportionately impacted. Water um, to the you know, on one side of the coin, where the other side of the coin. Um, <coughs> it doesn't mean we shouldn't be concerned and cautious about it. Um, just the information I have, and that makes a certain amount of sense to me. Yep. Um, <coughs> and even. Before that, uh, my observation, and from talking to our troopers, was that um, in the in the late winter, early spring, we had a small, visible population of homeless individuals in town that um, seems to have gotten smaller in the past few months, hmm. uh, for whatever reason. Okay. Any of the other issues in the uh, parking lot need attention? Maybe um, we should 
address uh, road salt use uh, sometime this fall? Sometime this fall. Uh, I am giving a presentation uh, to the State Department of Forests and Parks July 10th um, about utilizing the old state quarry. Um, that'll be a public meeting if anyone wanted to join in. I can get the Zoom link at some point. When did you say July 10th? July 10th. I don't have a time yet, but it's just going to be a presentation via Zoom, so I'll have a PowerPoint. I'm definitely going to participate in that. It's going to be exciting. Yeah, I'll, I'll, I completely want to watch this. Yeah. Do we want to add um, what Tom mentioned about capital um, improvement planning as a parking lot, or do we feel like that will come up via charter or other items? Um, we can put that in the parking lot, and it sounds like the, the first, from my notes, the first area is rec where we wanted to. Mm -hmm. Can we uh, address that maybe in August, on that uh, first uh, meeting in August? Same thing that I mentioned, or is that something different? I just want to make sure I'm not getting my fires crossed. You had mentioned uh, the hardware updates, the, Karen. The something. financials from the auditors. Oh, no, that one I know is moving to August, but something in the lines of recreation and infrastructure costs re part of fund investment. I think it's kind of a combo of the two. Oh, yeah. So some yeah. of that was specifically potential projects that we could spend ARPA on uh -huh. in those categories. But then the piece I feel like it would be nice to capture moving forward is, Tom was saying, in doing that, that might form the basis of a broader capital improvement right. okay. plan. I and I just think that's a great idea to look at mm -hmm. generally yeah. um, to inform ARPA and other things. Oh, Mike. Uh, Mike. Yep. Another thing we might, uh, I don't have the parking lot, but I don't believe it's on the parking lot. This came in my discussions with the uh, DRB and it's something that's been a long concern of mine. I know I spoke a little bit with Tom about it, about, you know, they're really concerned about the lack of, um, you know, certificate of occupancy, certificate of compliances, especially with all mortgage companies now are looking for that. I think we have to get kind of back on track you know, in our municipal system to, you know, start issuing those things. And I don't know how, if we need to, you know, have a discussion about that or that's just something I think it sounded like Tom said that's sort of in the works. Yeah, a lot of better things can happen there once we're up to staff too. Mm -hmm. So hopefully soon right. enough. As a new zoning administrator. Dina, yeah. Dina thought to get rid of that. Yes. I, and I think mostly because she didn't have the capacity to, mm -hmm. to, to release it. To staff it. As I recall, Dina fought to get rid of zoning compliance letters, which is saying this is definitely a thing. That and the idea of an inspection or occupation, if you build something according to plans, are mm -hmm. different. And the Planning Commission has talked about those, which has also mm -hmm. been a circular around someone doing an inspection to say, you are permitted for a three-bedroom house. Did you build a house with three bedrooms or 12? <laughs> uh -huh. But I know Dina did. Yeah, yeah as a well. house in Flutterbury Center that was built, it wasn't anything like they were permitted to build. Yeah. So I, I uh -huh. appreciate what you're saying, for sure. But I know she said. And she's like, it's not even binding, right? Because it wasn't that she would pull all this data and still something could have been there. Yeah, like, it didn't did really, inspection. they had she a lot of, yeah. Look. So, yeah, I think for her, it just seemed, why am I writing this letter? Uh-huh. <laughs> right. Um, so, we parked that someplace, or? Uh... Mm -hmm. Guess we'll... It's a permitting reform, anyway. Yeah, <laughs> maybe we back to all the permitting. Well, how about uh, I, I? All this stuff has been in the parking lot since my first meeting at the select board. <laughs> oh, we we moved a few things out. Oh, yeah. mm. uh, well, it's gotten smaller, but some of the things remain. Schedules of fees. Yeah. Uh, you noise for ordinance. This room. So not everything. No. We can I don't remember. I'm just saying. Fees well, that was for rec fees. <laughs> okay. That we haven't looked at. So that, 
we did adjust the fee for this room, but that parking lot item was specific to recreation. And fees. it was rec field fees, I believe. Oh, uh, yeah. Yeah. We can look at that in August. Why not? And uh, when do we need to do emergency management training? That was uh, Mr. Bard's right. it was. item. Ah, uh, Mr. Bard. Uh, he had sent a message. He was. One second. Okay, I'm unmuted. I think it's it's really important we could get the folks from the state emergency management to give us some sort of you know you know training you know and they'll schedule it as to what we need you know and it doesn't have to be like you know they give a class an eight hour class and i don't think that's something that the select board needs but the basics of emergency management i think are something important that all select board people should be aware of and you know it's something we could just you know work with gary Dillon on working with uh the state emergency management you know folks and scheduling some sort of training for them to do for us. All right. Would that be something that we could do in a public meeting in about an hour? Don't know offhand. I'm going to have to reach out to the state and find that out. And it, I expect it's not something they're going to be able to do in August. I think it's going to be a little longer than that. OK. All right. Well, yeah, I'd, probably, I'd probably Tom reach out to Keith Cubbin. You know, he's really good about, you know, he's very, you know, believes in training select boards and stuff like that. He would be a good resource. Okay, I can do that. Mm -hmm. And this isn't something that uh, VLCT would normally do. No. It's, it's, it's more of a state thing. Okay. Anyone else want to grab something out of the uh, parking lot? I just want to note for road salt use, the Conservation Commission has um, some good data there. Okay. I haven't had a chance to, to go through it yet, but um, came the conversation, I believe, originated during budget discussions, December, January. Um, so we talked about, after talking to Public Works, um, their observation was that towns that have low salt areas, it's a road sign, but it's not anything in reality. So they said if there's going to be a, uh, a policy to reduce salt, whether that's for cost savings or environmental reasons, to um, pick some roads um, and would just say, aside from maybe bridges or intersections, we're just going to, at some point in the winter, just pull the switch and not salt those roads at all. Would they be uh, dirt, dirted? Those yes. Ones? Yeah, they would. Well, we don't them. salt them anyway. We 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 dirt. No, no. He's talking <laughs> about the spreading dirt oh, just for sorry, public sorry. safety, yeah, yeah, as opposed to salt. Yeah, yeah. that was thank you, Roger. Yeah, sand, dirt, whatever. Yeah, concoction we come up with. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Well, it's also coming up. I know I was at the last conservation commission uh, meeting, and they're gonna. Uh, shortly they're going to be having the results of their community mapping you know the exercise that they went through in a public meeting and the results of that will be forthcoming so that you know probably what came out of the original community mapping and the results are probably going to be something that we should look forward forward to and gear to whatever projects you know we want to move forward with Okay, um, so then maybe we would invite uh, Billy Vigdor to make a short presentation to us at the beginning of August. I think that would be good. You know, again, in in uh, I think July, they're going to have I I think it's I forget if it's June or July is when they're going to have their community of uh, you know have the folks from Vermont Fish and Wildlife present in a public meeting the res results of the our co the community mapping session so as they say more news at 11. You know, 11 is the number of days left in june so fyi um okay 
I'll tentatively put Billy uh, and the uh, Conservation Commission uh, on in August, and uh, as to road salt use, uh, that could either happen in August or, or I think into uh, September. Yeah. I think I'm just going to put those items. Right, right. I'm not. If I can speak for a minute, so as you see on here, I'm going in August. I'm not here for either meeting. Um, so I, I'm happy to warn and create the agenda for the first August meeting on the 7th. I won't be here that Friday. Mm -hmm. But the next meeting, Beth will help um, as best as she can. I noticed today when I was building some templates for her that in September, your first meeting is scheduled on Labor Day. I have to work close that day. And imagine you want to meet that day. I don't need an answer tonight, but just an awareness. I put a placeholder on the calendar for the Tuesday the fifth, because if you do it the following week, then you start getting into the weeds with the planning commission and other other mm -hmm. things. So just an awareness about that, because you'll be making that decision when I'm gone as yeah. to what day you're going to have. Well, we can make that decision week. right now. <laughs> Anyone having a problem meeting on uh, Tuesday the fifth as opposed to Labor Day? All right, Mike, are you good? And Danny? I'll open my calendar. I think it should be fine, but I don't know unless I look at my calendar. <laughs> yeah, I don't need, I, I'm, I'm on my wife's cell phone, so I don't have access, but I think that's, that's fine. I think we should maybe should have kind of like, almost like a standardized policy when our mm -hmm. select board meetings fall on a federal holiday that, falls on one of those Mondays, our select board meetings automatically revert to the next, the following Tuesday, but be a nice, easy thing to do. Yeah, I agree. I think that makes sense, uh, unless otherwise I noted. Go ahead. Personally, have some struggles. My, uh, I work for a nonprofit. Our board meets quarterly on Tuesdays. So it's not every month, but it does happen to be that that Tuesday. So I can't attend um, the, that September. We can find another award, so you know it's okay. Um, but that's the Tuesday schedule for me. Hmm. Like I said, you don't need to make a decision tonight. I just want to put it out. Mm -hmm. to you. Just okay. want to throw a wrench in it for you. Um, any other? Anyone want to make another suggestion, like Wednesday? Yeah, I was thinking any time in the same week. <coughs> Does Wednesday bump us up against any? Uh, DRB any? is potentially meeting in this room. Maybe you just put a survey monkey or something out to see if we could all do that. Yeah, I, I don't want to build a survey monkey. Um, I don't even know how to build a survey monkey. <laughs> uh, okay. Um, If we went back to the week prior and did Friday the first, it still put us in our schedule. Friday? Okay, it's a suggestion. <laughs> <laughs> I do the thirty first, the Thursday first. I'm hard Fr on that yeah, one. Friday of Labor Day weekend might not be a winner. <laughs> I would agree with that rather. <laughs> We're not coming during people. <laughs> you can guarantee no public will attend. Right, there you go. Yeah, let's, let's bring up disc golf on that day. Um, okay, let's see. Um, Alyssa, you got a plan? Uh, suggestion. You I was going to move to adjourn, but... Oh, oh, oh. Before resolving this issue, the, the can will be... I said I would do warrants and I'd like to be home by a reasonable hour. Um, yeah, that's true. We, we are, we are at the... It feels of unresolved as uh, acting secretary okay. in August. No, we'll, August. We'll, we'll work on uh, this uh, first meeting on uh, September issue and try to get that resolved uh, in July. How's that? Before you go. I, that's fine. You can okay. resolve it in July. Yeah. Uh, I'm going to leave the placeholder on the calendar just in case. Good You're point. not going to zoom in from Europe? Nope. <laughs> It'd be fun. And we applaud that. <laughs> um, I will entertain a motion to adjourn. So moved. Second. All in favor say aye. 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 Any opposed? Aye. Hearing none, we are adjourned. Aye.